Here he Oh, he's making an entrance. <laughs> this will be so loud. We got oh. a new lick. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Start off with the boomer band. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to that pedal show. Uh, viewers, comments, and questions live. Um, Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Uh, okay, we had a buzzing last week. We might have it again this week. It's one of the fans. There's a compressor in in play. I love it's you. I love you. It's one of the fans, not that kind of fan. You could, it's literally inaudible where we're sat here. Right, but the compressor is. Yeah, okay. compressor likes it. Right, very good. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. hopefully you can hear us. Welcome. Here we are then. Bath Spa. Here we are. Bath Spa. Oh, I can't remember the next one. Um, Oldfield Park. Oh, okay. Bristol Temple Meads. Bristol Temple Meads, that's the one. Um, if you're new... And confused about what you're watching, welcome. Um, yeah, indeed, welcome. This is something that we do every Monday. Uh, comments and questions, you can ask us anything you like. We try to make it about the video that went out on Friday, wherever possible. Um, but it tends not to be that way. Yeah. And uh, we go off into subjects wide and varied. Indeed. That may cover modern philosophy, uh, wine, or indeed guitar effects pedals. <laughs> Who we got on then, Dan? You up? I uh, I am, for some reason, it logged me out and I cannot log back in. Ah. Uh, but that's okay. That's not okay. <laughs> because. <laughs> it's really not okay. I'm, tr I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. Ah, what is going on? This is good. They call this dead air on the radio. They do. They do. Um, anyway, so Friday's video was about going direct. We did it, in case any of you are asking, because uh, I'd helped a friend out recently with the pedal board, mm -hmm. where he was in the position of going direct. He was using one particular device that he stopped using and then decided he wanted a different solution. So we put it together. And I was, you know, not being a fan of, of direct sounds in general, for lots of reasons, which we'll probably discuss today. Um, really pleasantly surprised with the with the results we got. So I right. thought, Dan, you should hear this on the show. And we did a show, and unfortunately, it sort of went a bit flat, and everyone got really annoyed with us. But I got didn't... really annoyed with me, and I and I don't blame you. And I I, I wasn't want... annoyed with you. No, no, no. I, so just some of the comments over the weekend, um, and I. It was really, it was really interesting. I, I, I did try. I just, I just, I can't pretend if it's not happening for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, everyone, I think people that have been, have been watching the show for a long time know instantly when I'm into something or not. It's good. We're not very good liars. No, I cannot. Yeah. Um, but I, it's really, really interesting. I had my little laser jet at home the other day and I just turned it all the way down, plugged my board in. I was just working on some sounds. It just sounded great. And I thought it's, it's a really interesting thing, the um, playing quietly versus playing direct. Yeah. You know, because it's not necessarily that playing direct isn't necessarily that quiet. It's just controlled. Yeah, the control, I think, is the key. That issue, is the key isn't thing. It? That's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, and and I think in those environments where you are, well, again, as soon as any of us can get into the, I'm uh, in, I'm in. Okay. Um, when you can play in those environments where you have really good IEM mixes, yeah, um, and it's all very controlled, and your goal as a band is to sound a bit like a record, I think it's just perfect, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, makes a lot you of know, sense. You want to sound produced. It's really, really great for that. Mm. Um, Change the interface again. Oh no! I'm so bored of it. So um, okay, roll call. Where were you coming in from? Let's see. Um, uh, Jay Luke Mo says checking in from Saint Louis, Missouri. Saint Louis, Saint Louis. You would probably say. Saint would Louis. You? I don't know. Meet me in Saint Louis. Meet me in Saint Louis. Okay. Um, Mr. Anderson. We watched the Matrix on the weekend. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Mr. Anderson, 59, says hello from Chicago. I just... His sweet home. I just... I can't watch it with him in it. 
Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I Have just, you never seen The Matrix? I've seen it many times, but I just can't get into it because as soon as he comes every, on screen, you go, oh, no! Bill's going to move in at any point and go, <laughs> uh, I went to, so I went to see that at the cinema in Sydney. Yeah. And with, with zero idea what the film was about. Yeah. And I just I remember walking out, my mind completely blown. It was just wonderful. Yeah. A friend of mine actually did, you know the, the scene where the helicopter hits the building and mm. all, the, all the, the ripples? Mm. Uh, he did that scene. Really? He's a special effects guy. Wow, which scene. was hard work in those days. Very hard work. These days it's like shift apple make ripple, isn't it? And <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> That's very um, good. Johnny Willard, Chicago. G'day, mate. Yes. Fred, Fred Wolf from Dartmoor. Hello, Fred from yeah. Dartmoor. Jamie L. Cross the river in Cork. Nice. 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 I went there once. Uh, a. Bondi NS. Soggy, Nova Scotia, Canada. Johnny Headland. Uh, T. A. with a two dots over it. B. Y. in Sweden. Oh. Tabby. Uh. Ooh, to, to, uh. Uh. Do me. Um, <laughs> David Rustad. Hello, David. C uh, cloudy and cold, Richland, Washington. Michael Monroe. Greetings from Grand Prairie, Alberta. Grand, imagine living on Grand Prairie. Put, imagine putting that your address in. Where yeah. you live? Grand, Grand Prairie. Prairie. Um, Kelvin Mack. Greetings from Alberta, Canada. Uh, thanks for the escape. Uh, Ranzo. Hi from Israel. G'day, mate. Rich Sadowski. Sturbridge, M Massachusetts, MA, is that? I wonder if Sadowski, I wonder if you're related at all to the Sadowski music people. All sorts of things, all sorts of things. Uh, Tobias Vogel's gang. Hi from Saarbrücken in Germany. I've been to Saarbrücken in Germany. Yes, me too. Uh, played a gig there, actually. Really? Yeah. 12 Foot Chain. Greetings from Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, lovely. Um, we'll get there one day. Florida Tampa. Oh, we boo boo. Um, Cincinnati, Ohio, says Jeffrey Blake. Sorry, that was my very bad uh, half Bootsy impression because in quite a few of his records he says Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, all right. Well, all right. Well, all right. Uh, yeah. So Jay Lucamo says uh, pronounced Lewis, not Louis. Thank you. And K, uh, KJ Photo says cheers from the Big Apple. Uh, hello to the Big Apple. Be nice to go there again one day, wouldn't it, Dan? Oh, it's such a great time there. Uh, John W777, greetings from Dallas. Texas. He says Dallas, Georgia. Maybe oh. maybe there's a Dallas in Georgia. Uh, back online after a move. Well, congratulations. Yeah, that's always when you move house. That first bit of internet connection you get in your in your in in your new house mm. is yeah. always really satisfying. No one in your house is organised to make it work from the minute you move of in. Course. No, of course not. Unless you're married to Catherine. Right. In which case, it works the second you walk through the front door. <laughs> It's always about two to three weeks for me. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, we haven't got any internet. And the kids, like, collapse. Um, Michael Hans says, Dan, you convinced me to get a telly myself. Thanks for the inspiration from you both. Ah, oh, cheers, mate. Never look back. Lee Pettifoot. Hi, Dan and Mick. Greetings from Swindon. Love TPS and you guys. Also, a big thumbs up for Dougie, an old school friend. Oh, mate. Love that man. Much more Dougie coming this Friday. Yeah. He's so good. He is so good. Um... Uh, Albus Band, Aaron Heiss says all my love to you and BV Ninja with this being the whole um, Cyber Monday, Black Friday lead up. This warehouse is nuts. Aaron works in a warehouse. 5,000 items daily and it's me versus the inventory. Oh boy. That's a big deal. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yep. Uh, yes, Thanksgiving, of course, this week um, and which has been taken over by Black Friday. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which uh, you may or may not be happy about, but um, yeah. Speaking of Black Friday, we yeah. got Christmas, <laughs> Christmas shirts in. Yeah, yeah. Holiday. I think they'd be perfectly okay on Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thankful for this. Um, either either gain deer, yeah, or rain gear. Gain deer. I like gain it. deer. Yeah. Um, uh, Rudolph the. Oh, red nose because he's probably, LED. A, probably an alcoholic. Rudolph, Rudolph the, the LED, LED nose reindeer. Very good. Yeah? Very good. Yeah, yeah, good. Right, let's get into these cues then. Um, uh, 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 yes. We'll, we'll have a, we'll have an announcement a little bit later on. Yeah. A little bit, but we're not just yet. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to wait. We're going to get into it a little bit. Get into the flow. Petit announcement. And when we're in the middle of the flow, I'm going to 
Yeah. <laughs> break the flow. We're going to break the flow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, DNM, says Plexico. Hey, Plexico. I got the DNM reindeer t shirt, the pedal reindeer shirt, he says. Thank you so much. And it raised eyebrows at the family dinner table. Nice. Good. Very good. good. Um, thanks. So, any thoughts on the Mallard OC81D tranny? That's obviously a transistor. OC81D used in treble boosters, maybe? Um, the. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. I've got a bunch of OC81. I've got OC. What have I got in my stuff? For a tone bender, maybe? It's the holy grail for tone benders. Right. Um, I don't think either of us have really been down the rabbit hole that far. No. I've got a bunch of OC uh, transistors in my old treble boosters that... and. You've got to be a bit careful. Um, I remember with my original Java boost, I've had a couple of them, and one of the original uh, Mallard transistors I had in it, it sounded, sounded just amazing for about six months. And then one night, it just didn't happen. And I couldn't work out. And scratching my head anyway, um, Robert sent me a new transistor for it. And I popped out the old one, popped the new one in, because it was done in, it had little uh, sockets yep. that you could swap them over. Yep. A new one sounded amazing. Six months later, same jobby. Oh, wow. So, it was, yeah. Got a bit, uh, but I don't know if, because, you know, they're all different. They all have different leakage factors and, you know, gain factors and all that stuff. And even the same model is all very different. Like, uh, those... Those old transistors, you can have a hundred, and you might find ten that are appropriate. So, you know, what goes wrong with them then? Well, you got to remember that you know the the germanium stuff is is unstable, um, which is the reason that people went to silicon. You know, but they're very affected by heat, as we know. Um, so they get they can get worse over time. They can degrade. Yeah, I like caps. The transistors, uh, it's weird. They, they, yeah, it's just something to be aware of. They can go wrong. They, they're not as robust as the silicon ones, you know. Um, so, no, we don't really, sorry, Plexico, have too much insight on that. I've never sat there and swapped out transistors in fuzzes and things. Um, maybe those days has come. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can ask Marcus Reeves about that when he comes in. That'd be fun. Brad Jackson. Hello, Brad. Hello, Brad. Hello, DNM. I've got a cue about Boss Overdrive pedals. Uh, with the input buffer seeing the impedance that the pedal sees. Hang on. With the input buffer seeing the impedance that the pedal sees. Okay, lost already. Keep going. Um, You've got two pedals. The, the input buffer seeing the impedance that the pedal sees before it. No. Uh, so you plug your guitar in. Yeah. Input impedance. Yeah. And then what happens next? That's what the pedal's seeing. What the circuit is seeing, the input buffer. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what accounts for whether how a pedal will clean up? It must differ from a vintage fuzz, but how? So think of a vintage fuzz, and the vintage fuzz has got... Okay, so this is really interesting, right? Remember before we're talking about, in the buffer show, we're talking about the... All the elements that go into it, all the um, and uh, and how the reactance levels of the um, capacitance uh, and the inductance as all frequency sensitive, right? But we also talked about that inductance, and we talked about um, the like the coil and how that reacts. Well, if you think about the, um, what ends up happening is you get that, the, uh, the more the resistance, the more that Q, that, um, that peak is sort of squashed down, right? If you think about the, when, with the really low input uh, impedance, that Q is sort of squashed down all the way, so that when you add more resistance with your, um, 
volume control, the whole th the, the level look like all across the board is sort of brought down, much more so than the when you've got when you add more resistance, it starts to bring that peak down. Anyway, very dull. It goes it's just to say a lot of it has to do with um, the input impedance of the pedal. So your boss pedals generally normally about five hundred k. They're not they're advertised as a mega, I think, but they actually. 500 plus K generally, um, your fuzz face can be like 10 K mm. and super any, low, super, super low. Um, but that's it. You know, it has to do with a lot of things. It's got to do with, you know, the guitar to start with, um, you know, the impedance is very important. The, the gain structure in the pedal, it can be a combination of things. Um, like I love the way, the blues blues driver uh, cleans up, and that's still a high impedance pedal. So it's not all about the impedance. You know, direct coupling can have a big impact on it as well. Pickups or everything. How much gain you got rolled on? Yeah, it's all like that. saying, "What is why is this steak tasty?" Yeah, you know, it would be good. It would be a great thing to delve into, though, to try and pick some of those factors out and go, "Okay, what is the defining factor here? Then how do we?" Ensure that the guitar cleans up nicely when we turn it down. Sure. Is it purely imp impedance or? Oh no, it's a blood, yeah, yeah, a bunch, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, yeah. Good, qu great question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, we don't have a name. No name. Uh, no name. Anyway, it's D Herbert. It says, Dan, any ice pick issues with any of your tellies and the Princeton? I read lots of advice. What's yours? So I'm playing a newfangled American Pro Two and a '65 Princeton reverb reissue. Just Thank turn, you. Just if you can turn the Princeton up, you won't have any of those issues. The Princeton, more than any other amp I've ever played, the amp changes so drastically between one and a half and two, between two and three, like just a tiny percentage increase in that Princeton. It's a different instrument. Um, so Dan lives on and for treble. Treble is Dan's place and he likes it. And he's got such a, he hits the guitar so hard that, quite often on a telly those treble frequencies even on a clean sound are overdriving before they hit the amp i know this having done the audio for week in week out for god knows how long mm. i hear this in my ears when i'm doing the audio um so right from the right from the get-go how much you know ice pick is one thing lots of treble but actually if you can hit the amp with sufficient amplitude yeah um, then it will start to overdrive a bit and those those trebles roll off a bit. For most of the rest of the humans on Earth, just roll the tone pot back yeah. about to about seven or eight, which is what a lot of people who aren't necessarily as confident with telly as Dan is. As um, a word. Uh, that tends to work for most of the rest of the planet. Confident. Yeah, me included, actually. I always... Unless if the if the amp is overdriving where you've got a bit of gain in the overdrive pedal, very happily have it all flat out. But if you're on one of those I know I know exactly what you mean with the with that particular kind of fender black panel sound. Mm. It's particularly bad in a deluxe reverb when the bright cap is yeah. doing its thing too, unless yeah. you've got it cranked. So totally understand what you're talking about. Just try roll that um tone knob back a bit and you should find that will cease to be a problem. And that you know in bright channels of amplifier, the more that you turn up, the less that bright cap is yeah. in the signal. So, yeah. you know, that's going to be part of it as well. But when the amp starts to limit and, yeah, all, all the magic happens. But, mm. yeah, as Mick said, the tone control is your friend. And the uh, <laughs> the ice pick when you're sort of sat at home trying to play and sound nice and have a nice time is a hateful thing but the minute you get in a band you probably find yourself turning the bright switch on again should your amp have one Princeton mm. doesn't I know mm. um, and just looking for a bit more of that punchy high end because that's what you need to get over the symbols and stuff hopefully all topics which we'll discuss a bit more as we do the band format yep a bit lovely more. yeah good luck yeah uh, Corey Shoemaker or indeed Schumacher maybe Shoemaker um, <laughs> thanks to you both he says uh, I have learned so much from TPS Legends. Oh, what are thanks, your mate. thoughts on sticking with a board uh, and tweaking settings to get out of a rut uh, as opposed to just buying new stuff? Uh, 
Yeah, I would say it's it's really tricky without knowing what you're going for. Mm. Um, you know, if you've got a clear idea of the sound that you're going for, and it's and you just know it's not in there, then you know, explore some new stuff. However, if you're just if you're sort of exploring sounds, um, you know, like when we recorded. Uh, we did a film last week and we had uh, Tube Screamer and the SD9. Mm. It's astonishing the sounds you can get out of those, those two pedals, you know, just from different tone positions, different game positions, volume positions. It's amazing. It might be... Did you say SD9? Um, was it the SD9? SD3. SD1. SD1. SD9. Yeah, sorry, I'm, my brain's on a 10-second delay today. Uh... SD one, SD one, but <laughs> get, yeah, getting to, getting to grips with the gear that you have, um, is great. And after you've explored it fully, and then you say yes, the sound I really want's there, or not. It's hard to know what fully is, isn't it? Yeah. It's certainly thinking the the SD one brought back a lot of memories of me for me particularly because as we explained in the video, when I was a kid, I say a kid, sorry, uh, I don't know, sixteen, seventeen, just getting into bands and doing all of that you could only buy two pedals in my local music shop boss or arion that was all that was available right. so it was boss because they had a number of yellow overdrives and i went through them all and you know you got guitar magazines with mail order but there's no internet there's yeah, no yeah. youtube you can't really see any of this stuff so you're forced to learn you know get what you can out of the gear you've got and that's good to a certain point but then i wish i'd discovered fuzz faces when i was 18 not when i was yeah, yeah. 38 yeah yeah or 28 or whatever it was so it, yeah it's a tough one isn't it balancing out that kind of gas for going this will solve this problem for me versus actually i probably can do it with this stuff so yeah I, I, you know what my first lesson with that was i think i was about 13 and my sister was doing this gig in a church in Brisbane. And I was at sound check with them. And the guitar player, they're trying to play it was like they were trying, trying to play the song. And I knew the chords he was trying to play, right? And I wanted so much to go up there and go, no, you're doing it wrong. And I thought, no. Even at 13, I knew to do that, I would be an absolute idiot. Don't do that. <laughs> Sit down and shut up. And he was there going, oh yeah, it just doesn't sound right. And I'm going, no, you're not playing it right. It doesn't sound right. I know what I need. I've got this delay at home, this rack delay, <laughs> and if I get that, it's going to sound perfect. So he got that delay put in a cab, sent to the church. He got it hooked up. He goes, yeah, there it is. And Darcy's going, yeah, no, it's still not right. You know? Wow. Um, and it's, like, it's a really you know, nice, nice analog rack delay. You know, it was really cool. Uh, but it's like, no... He, what he actually needed to do was just play the right notes play the right notes <laughs> don't tell everyone that <laughs> that's the last episode ever hello welcome to that pedal show actually all you need to do is play the right notes good night <laughs> but it's just you know that's just an example of um the gear for him at that point was not yeah, the yeah. answer yeah right yeah good luck Good luck. Yeah, good luck, mate. Um, Harrison. Hello, Harrison. I've got a Strat question. He says, I recently got a plas Placid Blue, presumably Lake Placid Blue, Strat from ATB. Did you now? Oh, wow. <laughs> Assuming that's, hello. that's a fairly significantly smart guitar. I'm struggling to connect with it at lower volume. I've tried all the mid-boost options from the Strat video. Do you have any other advice? Thanks, gents. Um, yeah, what amp are you playing it with? Have you got plenty of reverb on? That mm. always, I find that works with the Strat. The... the don't know what guitar you're coming from, so I'm going to make an assumption, given that you say you've recently got the Strat, I'm going to assume that you came from a different kind of guitar, and if that is the case, um, they're real funny animals, Strats. Mm. Like any guitar, you've got to let it be what it is. So if you're used to playing... I did the opposite thing. I played a Strat ever since I was, I don't know, 14, 13 years old. And then when I was about 17, I got a Les Paul, and I couldn't play it. I got rid of it. I just... A real one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've I got see. a like a one of those. Fifty-nine. So, you know. No, one of those standards of the period, which weighed like boat anchor. What year was it? 
Uh, well, if I 90s? was if I was sixteen, that would have been nineteen ninety. Okay. Was so it a studio? It, no, no, no. It was a Les Paul standard. Oh. It was an eighties Gibson Les Paul Ooh. standard. Tobacco sunburst. Oh um, wow! Probably weight relieved, um, but still like a boat anchor. Um, and I just couldn't play it. Mm. I couldn't. I should do all the things I tried to do on my Strat. I just could not play it because I didn't understand what a Les Paul did and what it was for. Right. And it might be that you're experiencing a little bit of that. You just have to let it be what it's going to be. One thing I would urge you to do is not hit the guitar so hard. Right. At lower volumes and just hold the notes. Let them let them do their thing and just let it be a Strat. Maybe play some Stratty type things on it. I mean, you don't have to be cliched about it, but it's a good place to start. I don't know, play some Stevie Ray softer stuff or some Hendrixy stuff or, I don't know, John Mayo in the positions two and four and just see if you can start to bond with it. A lot of reverb will really help. Hmm. And then the paradox of that situation is <laughs> once the volume starts going up, I just do think you need to work the Strat a bit harder than you do other guitars. So right. with Gibsons, I sit right off them. No, I never hit yeah, hit right. the Gibson in the same way that I would hit the Strat with because it just won't take it. Yeah, and that's what I because it just gets to that limit so quickly. It's just there. Yeah, There's yeah. no dynamic yeah. range left, and yeah. that's that was the problem I had in my Les Paul. Yeah. Plus, it was twice as loud as the Strat, so I was doing both of those things and going. There's nothing in this guitar. Yeah, All it right. is is barking my head off. So you might feel the opposite of that, where nothing is making any kind of push. So. Um, uh, is the action really low? That's another problem with vintage type strats. If the action can, is really low, the, sometimes the strings just aren't really singing out. Um, but yeah, dial a bunch of reverb in, um, turn it up a little bit if you can, and just let the guitar play some chords, you know, let the guitar just have its voice. There's a couple of vlogs and also the strat show that we did where we explore in quite uh, great detail everything Mick's talking about. So maybe just mm. give that a watch and go through it and see if there's anything there that connects with you. But yeah, it's, it is, um, it, you know, if you're coming from a different guitar, it's yeah can take a bit. Conversely, if you're coming from other strats and you just don't like it, totally possible. Yeah. As you well know, I love strats, but I don't love 80% of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so true. Um, it just might not be the right sort of configuration for you. Uh, yeah, could be that. Could be that. Indeed. Uh, Prog Doggy. From up there in Canada. Across and up there in Canada. It's cold up there at the moment. Is it? Really cold. Depends where you are, probably. Joey sent me a picture of his. <laughs> it was just like, dude, look at this rubbish. <laughs> it was just snowing and everything <laughs> outside. Car, like you just see the roof of the car. <laughs> yeah, full of snow. It's like, ah. Dan dislikes the cold intensely. <sighs> Not your thing, is it cold? I I like going to the snow for like a week. If you if you're there, like yeah, yeah, give me a hot chocolate, you know, warm up by you know, sit yeah. by the fire, yay. Uh, where off to now? Oh, I'm gonna catch a plane and go to the sunshine. Awesome, but I do like I've been here this January. I'll have been in the UK for twenty years, and wow. I'm still still not, not used to it. Still not used to it. Hmm. I st here's, okay, UK. It can be a beautiful day in, in the middle of summer, right? Sun, down, like, you know, gorgeous. You walk in the shadow of a building and it's like, oh God, what the hell is that? It, as soon as you're not in direct sunlight in the UK, it's cold. It's cold. And I, I don't know the, why the, you came here, mate, honestly. The, the, <laughs> the um, woman, of course. Um, <laughs> the, the funny thing is, even after 20 years, I still, I see the sun. I go, oh, it's sunny day. T-shirt, shorts, let's go. <laughs> Uh, that still doesn't think, oh, yes, right, you're in the UK, you absolute... Anyway. <laughs> I, I, on the other hand, really like the cold. So uh, there we are. That's the difference between us, Dan. Right. Um, <laughs> Prog Doggy. Uh, quick reminder that cheap guitars can be great. Yeah. You'll, yeah. Hopefully you'll never hear us saying anything else. Totally. Um, I got a Squire Custom 60s a Squire, and I'm shocked at how good it is. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and on a sadder note, really sad news about David Longdon. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't heard Big Train, you should and give him a try. Yeah, of course, uh, Dan, very friendly with the other Dave. Yeah, so I... I um, it's very very sad. I, I recorded a couple of tracks on um, one of their albums and did a solo on one of their albums um, 
for a while, Dave and I were both going to be doing guitars in there, but we, uh, we got very busy doing other stuff. Um, but yeah, I knew those guys very well, and they were very supportive of Ten Spirits, and um, they really liked what we were doing. And uh, when I there was a the first album that David Longdon was on was an album called The Underfall Yard, and I think it's also the first album Dave was on. Yeah. Just remarkable. The playing in it is just off the charts. And David brought a new energy to that band and uh, his vocal was astonishing. And yeah, it's just heartbreaking. Mm. Um, yeah, really, really, really sad. Mm. Thanks for reminding us yeah. of that, Prog Doggy. And uh, yeah. Steve Rennie. Hello, Steve Rennie says, Big love, DNM. Friday's show confused me. Why did you throw the valves out with the bathwater? Why not a valve preamp and cab sim before the FRFR, for flat range full response, uh, full, re full range flat response, um, or something like a Rev D20, which I was thinking of buying. Yeah, a lot of people ask this, actually. Why didn't we put any valves in the mix, Dan? The idea was to get a standard pedal board and see what it sounds like. It wasn't So we weren't trying to make those things work. It was about, here's a couple of... Common or garden pedals. The kind of pedals that you'll find on everyone's pedal board. And that will stick into a valve amp and make yeah. it go, you know, that's great. Yeah. What happens when these go into the thing? Now, not just those as solutions, they're amazing. Absolutely. And there are ways that you can make it work, but we weren't there trying to say, well, if you do this and do this and do yeah. this, it'll sound great. There were some amazingly complex suggestions coming through in the in the comments of the video. Like if you do this and if you do that, you stand on your head, face west. And uh, then, then it sounds good. It's like, well, yeah, we could keep we could keep mining it. We could keep doing it. And you, you know, you're right. I think it would be really interesting to hear. We did discuss it before we started filming. So let's get a couple Kingsley preamps, and just give it the the the, the best front end we possibly can. And quite rightly, we came to the conclusion of actually, do you know what? No, there's a two year waiting list on that stuff. Yeah. Um, it. it, it People will just say, oh, why don't you use normal pedals? Now, of course, what we should have done is use both, probably. Mm. So if we do ever revisit it again, I think that would be a good way to do it. My opinion on it is that purely from a personal perspective, right, standing next to the amp in the room and playing in the way that I like to play, which is next to the amp, uh, the only thing I like coming through my wedge is um, vocals. And if... It's very rare that I'm on a stage big enough, personally speaking, to need a band mix through my wedge. You know, mm. I don't play in stadia, play in pubs where the monitoring is either non-existent or a wedge for your vocals. Mm -hmm. Or small clubs, same thing. So I've got ambient bass and drums and other guitar, no worries and keys. I can hear everything. I don't need that coming through my wedge. I only want vocals. What I definitely don't want through my wedge is guitar. Mm. What I want is that coming out of the guitar amp and back to the point, when you break that, when you take away the, in, in, in my case and in Dan's case, valve output section, output transformer, a cabinet made of nice wood, speaker, and the physical interaction that that has as a guitar player, it th then doesn't matter what else you do. So even if you did put the best Kingsley preamp in the world on the front, it doesn't matter because it all gets broken at that point where you do away with all that other stuff. Which is not to say that thousands of people don't use it and get great results because mm. they don't play in that way. They don't require that constant feedback loop of... And the other, hopefully, I mean, this may come up. One of the other... So yours um, question, Steve, was the, the most common question in terms of why didn't you do this? The second most common question was, well, hang on a minute, all those brilliant records were made with the guitar player stood in the control room mm -hmm. and the amps off in the, uh, you know, where they were being mic'd up. And that's very true. So you, the inference being that you break that physical connection between guitar and speaker cab, there's definitely some of it happening with really, really good studio monitors. Definitely. <laughs> so if you've got the monitors cranked in the control room and they are really, really good studio monitors, like, you know, 20 grand's worth of studio monitors, not flipping a 10p out front PA cab, which is what you're like, likely to have. We had that when we went to real world. Yeah. And we walked in, saw the monitors and just went, it was like this yeah. tower. And we tracked and with the like, monitors oh, really loud. And man. it was like, yeah, that, 
that, amazing that's a that's a, a feedback loop i can get into yeah um so yeah that's why we didn't do it and maybe we should revisit it I, um maybe if another product comes out because the reason we did the video was because i heard the dsm humboldt for the first time and thought wow that's a that feels like a game changer in terms of what i've been hearing from direct options f for some time much preferred it to anything else i'd heard and i wanted dan to hear it that's why we did the video mm. um as it turns out we <laughs> we probably won't be doing one again for a minute but um yeah what i think what will be really interesting but the sorry just to finish that the recorded sounds were pretty good recorded and they were they and were I, when i heard them back i was like oh okay yeah and because that's what that's you what, get that's when what, you're in your IEM world. Yeah, yeah. Because in the room, it was like, it was, it was hard. But when you hear it back in the, in the recorded thing, it was like, I, so these things sound like a recorded yeah. produced guitar. And that's and great. And that's that's it, isn't it? That's entirely the point. Once it's recorded and mixed and mastered and put in a record, I mean, lots of people say you can't hear it. You you can, but it doesn't sound like inferior or worse or anything else yeah it it sounds really great and i think that's why when people watch youtube demos of the two things being compared it's so confusing you stand in the room next to them and it's quite a different experience yeah. but regardless of all that stuff yeah that it's finding having options and things that will get you playing and finding the options that work for you if if your situation is you absolutely need a silent stage mm then oh you want one oh you want a silent stage then there's some things to look at yeah you know i i, I can't um i would never choose to play on a silent stage personally but if i if i was playing in a pit or or whatever i went and saw war of the worlds and um expecting to see uh chris what's his name herbie flowers is playing and um uh the guitar player uh, anyway, I thought of you know see them there with their old amps and go ooh la, but no, they had pods on stage, and they were super super quiet because they were sat there with a forty piece orchestra, you know, and everything had to be really controlled, and they sounded great. Um, yeah. Indeed. Sorry, I was just uh, on the, vo the, the the voices are really quiet. We've got some work to do. They 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 get quieter which I, I cannot for the life of me understand. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to turn the Super Chats off because we've got... Chris Spenning. Thank you, Peter Jessup. We have got so many Super Chats. Thank you very much, everyone. But I have got to turn them off. Otherwise, we're in trouble and we'll be here until tomorrow, which we can't be here until tomorrow for lots of reasons. So if you have Super Chatted to this point, we will answer. If you haven't, no more Super Chats. Close. Uh, we've got our second experience day on Friday. We do. So we do. If, you, amazing. if you're watching, you're going to be coming to that. We look forward to meeting you on Friday. Uh, the first one was Ace. So we're hoping so the second fun. one will also be Ace. Yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> um, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, we better hurry up. Okay. Um, Curtis R. Ends of legs. Today I sent my G7 off to Mike Piera for less noise, more headroom. I love that pedal, but it's time to put its big kid pants on. Yeah, well done. Uh, do you have a favourite mod by Mike or anybody else? Cheers from Kansas City. Um, my favourite mod is my old Keeley modded blues driver. That thing sounds flippant exceptional. Um, but I've ne I don't know what he's done. I've purposely never gone in and explored it. I just, I just want to enjoy it without trying to analyze it too much because mm. uh, it sounds great. Analog Man, I just love his pedals. I, um, his Ditto. Yeah, yeah. He, everything he makes is, is phenomenal. I haven't explored the world of his mods. I know that people do love them, but... Things like the the Bad Bob Boost and the his fuzzes and stuff is, and his delays, his choruses, they're just as they're as good as money can buy. Yeah, and I, agree. I just totally love that man's gear. Yeah, yeah. I think so many of his things, so many of Mike's things, are developed alongside people that he knows really well, yeah. and that are out playing all the time. And for that reason, they work really well. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's great. He, he doesn't. He's not saying. 
uh, he's not imposing a hundred percent of his own thing on there. He works with people and and gets them to, you know, uh, have input and stuff. And and what ends up with is just magic. Yeah, really magic. Yeah, um, I've got a. Keely modded 808, which I really love. I've also got an Analog Man modded um, Maxon OD9, oh, yeah. which I really, really love. Um, and I, again, I don't really know what the mods are. I just know that I connect with the pedals. And it's not, I, I, I don't think it's purely psychosomatic because, you know, we've got hundreds of pedals. And when I plug something in, I know if I connect with it or not. Mm. Um, might not be necessarily a tonal thing. It's like, a, ah, all yeah, these yeah, notes yeah, are coming yeah. out of my guitar. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Mike seems to hit that target more than pretty much anybody else. Yeah. Jam, actually. Jam's another company that, that I connect with anything yeah. that they make. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, Supro Black Magic or Supro Saturn, says Magic Man. Oh, what's the Saturn? I don't know. I haven't played the Saturn, so can't really say. We do have a Black Magic, and you can hear it on the show on Friday. That sounds superb. Yeah, absolutely superb. Um, it's very interesting actually doing the audio. They're very complimentary those amps. Really. In terms of mid range, yeah. So we use it. Well, actually, they're behind me. Why do I? It's behind you. Super Pro okay. Black, Black okay. Magic and a sixty-five Deluxe Reverb. Do the Panto season. See? <laughs> It's behind you. <laughs> um, Where? They really complement each other, those amps. Yeah. I was recording with them, with with the band, was just magic. Yeah. Yeah, it's another band show on Friday. So uh, good. So good. Looks like the Saturn's got reverb. Oh, wow. Which is really cool, because um, the Black Magic that we have does not have reverb, although I do believe there is a black magic with reverb. Can you check the super chat? Someone's a super chatter, I believe. That's just come in. Mm. Isn't that weird? Okay. Oh, it's on. I turned it off. It's so annoying. Anyway, we will answer anyone who super chatted. Apologies for my grumpiness. We need a producer, Dan. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm getting, the older I get, the less good I am at juggling plates. Unfortunately. I'm not sure is there any ever good, any, any ever good, can't even get the words out. Uh, yeah, so the Saturn is interesting. If it's one with reverb, that might swing it for you, but they're mm. both 25 watts. Um, yeah, don't know. Don't know. We really like the Black Magic. Look, yeah, it's the Black Magic is superb. Yeah. But if you want reverb, Saturn. But if you don't need reverb, Black Magic, lovely. Henry Hugh Huisman oh one. Henry Huisman oh one. He says no question. Just some money for the Adabasis to the Funland Fund. Um, TPS inspired me not to buy a new bass, but to enter the rabbit hole of tone. I got twelve pedals on my current board and still exploring sounds every day. Amazing. Amazing. Good on you. Well, we isn't that funny? Because on the the bass rig, we used to record that, and we had um, a couple of the new Ampeg pedals in there, and I had so much fun playing, playing bass. bass. Yeah, we both opened oh, up. Oh my god! We both a little so more good. adventurous on the bass yeah, in this one. It's wonderful. Um, massive thanks to BV as always uh, for moderating this week and uh, for keeping us in touch with what's going on. BV, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, as thank always. you, mate. David Cummings, joke of the day, says David. He says, I thought I was a legend. It turns out I'm just a heel. Keep up the good work. Thanks, David. <laughs> pet Moxie. Hello, Pet. Hello, Pet. Uh, hi, both. Got the Celestian Gold fitted and cooking. I believe that was in your Princeton, wasn't it? Oh, nice. Um, cheers for the advice. Overwhelmed with all the UAD plugins. Uh, what are the essential ones for a singer-songwriter? Oh. And Michael. Century Channel Strip is the one I would go with first. It's got a preamp, an EQ, and a compressor in it, and it's really great. Whenever I do anything that's just vocals and guitar, I always use it. Um, and you can use it either as a unison preamp plugin strip, or you can apply it afterwards. It's really great as a unison pl plugin. Um, that's fantastic. I'm a massive fan of the API Vision Channel Strip, which you can hear right now. 
right now. It has a preamp, really fantastic EQ section. It's got two types of EQ that you can put together. Um, a gate, uh, a compressor, low pass filter, all the things you would expect. Um, massive fan of the 1176 compressors yeah, and the LA2A com uh, compressor limiter Teletronics. Those are the things that we use consistently um, along with the Neve 1073 Pre. So there's so much good stuff. Yeah, but I would say is. if you go with the Century Tube Channel Strip, um, Singer Songwriter is great. Uh, the API just gives you a bit of sculpting and gain boosting option on top of that and then the 1176 and the la2a are quite nice sort of smoothing shaping gelling mm. things also utterly exceptional is the capital no um actually capital chambers is capital great chambers is really good but the uh what's it called ocean, uh, ocean studios, studios is reverb yeah. is flipping fantastic magic yeah very good there um, you go. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Have fun. Elena Stacy. Hello, Elena. Hello, Elena. Hey, Dean. Um, you say that you like analog modulation. Any thoughts about different kinds of tremolo? Does the type, e.g., optical, make a big difference? Absolutely. Um, tremolo is so interesting. So, we did a tremolo pedal with Jam, a harmonic tremolo. Uh, but the standard amplitude tremolo is is wonderful. And again, with all of you know, with all the analog circuits, those tiny little differences in the circuit actually make a big difference to the way the thing sounds, the way it feels to play. It's why there isn't, you know, only three tremolo circuits on the market, but there are hundreds mm. because those little differences do translate into the way that the, you know, how symmetrical that wave is. And you can, you know, change a lot of that on the, um, you know, on the pedals where that, you know, um, how the wave falls in, in symmetry and uh, just the just the nature of the sound of the thing. Yeah, all that stuff makes a makes a difference. It's actually worthy of a show because if you think, I don't know if the first types of tremolo were output bias. Sort of stands to reason that they may have been, yeah, but anyway, one one way of doing it in old amps is output bias. So you vary the output bias of the output tubes, mm -hmm. which is what creates the the tremolo, right? So what else are you doing in that? You're you're changing the whole relationship of everything through the amp by putting the output tubes up and down. You know, so the output transformer is doing a different job, and that obviously has a very different effect on the sound than if there's a separate circuit in the amp, an optical circuit. Um, doing the trem in a, in a different way. So for sure it will make a big difference. Um, we should do that show. I want to do that show, though. I want to get a diamond yeah. tremolo oil nice. can thing because they're flipping amazing. Yeah, let's do it. I yeah. think that would be so, so, so interesting because yeah. it is, you know, it's very easy to look at tremolo and go, oh, it's just turning the volume up and down. But as you quite rightly suggest, how you turn that volume up and down is a really big deal. Yep. Nice. Totally. Yeah, would be a good excuse to look at the latest stuff from um, Origin as well, which we've been really slow on. Okay. Oh yeah. yes, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, great. Is that a, do they do that as a separate thing now? Is it still part of the the preamp? No, it's two separate ones now. Right. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, preamp. we don't. We we're not. The super chat is still on. I've turned it off twice. Mm -hmm. That'll be bad. Technology. It is interesting. To turn Super Chat on, you need to click one thing once. To turn it off, you need to click three things. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they're so naughty. I was uh, cancelling all my social media accounts of, for this week, and getting off Facebook is kind of easy enough. It takes a month. Right. But getting off Instagram, some weird thing happened and it wouldn't let me do it. And I tried it again, some weird you, thing, you, and it wouldn't you, let me do it. You're too handsome. The world needs more images of you. They don't want you to leave, do they? No. And no. YouTube definitely don't want us to turn the super chat off because they get 30%. Anyway, not that I'm, I'm just, just, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit tired today. Yeah, we had a big weekend. Mick and I went out with our wives on the oh, weekend. We did. It was lovely. We did. We had a lovely time. Um, okay. Okay. Everything's good. And we are grateful for the super chats. Of course we are. We are. Of course we are. Of course we are. And yes. So let's move along. Um, 
sending love and appreciation again, chaps. The recent videos have been superb, says Josh. Thank hello. you, Josh. Hello, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Um, any experience with the Origin Magma 57? There you go. Uh, vibe and drive in one. It's very tempting. We don't actually have one, and I would very much like one. Okay. We'll get on the phone. Yeah. Um, Oi. What we need to do is get that. We need to get a magnetone amp, and we also need to get the um, Crazy Tube Circuits King V, which we do have, Killer V. Right. Which okay. is, is that as well. Fabulous. Here's Bebbers with my... Oh, it's ah. Rosie. Small doggy. Hello, hello baby dog. Hello, darling. Hello, beautiful girl. Yes, hello. Hello, yes. Rosie's, Rosie's come back from, uh, from, um, from daycare. So this is that pedal dog. Hello, hello Rosie Poopins. Do you want to come and say hello? Come say hello. I know. She's getting bigger now, so she doesn't really like being picked up. But come on, look at the camera then, Rosie. Good girl. There you go, baby dog. Yes. So, She's so pretty. That little thing that was running around in here. A year ago, we've had you a year, haven't we? Hello. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> My little baby dog. Have you had a nice day? She's been with all her friends today at daycare. Yeah, lovely. Okay, off you go, Rose. Good girl. Oh, bless her. She's so good. Pup date. Yeah, pup date. Uh, where were we? Um, yes, we should do that, Josh. Certainly all the demos I've heard sound really good of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, their stuff is so good. Killer, yeah. Um, it, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Magnetone had a very specific type of uh, vibrato mm -hmm. in stereo. Now, I'm guessing that the Killer V doesn't, and the Magma 57 doesn't do stereo. I don't think it does. But it's a pitch vibrato rather than a harmonic tremolo, which is a different thing. So I think that would be a pretty interesting show. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and plus the overdrive sound of it, which is a very specific thing. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I missed you last week, says Justin Baylog. Uh, just want to say thanks for everything. My board is almost complete. That is the mantra that you'll have for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, as I've had it for the last, you know, my board is almost there. Thanks, almost Justin. There. Really enjoyed your film, by the way. Justin um, sent us a link to a film he'd made in South America. They were doing some stuff. Uh, it was really very cool. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, what a pretty dog, says Jimmy Marches Soto. Thank you, Jimmy. She is. She's gorgeous. She's we a love lovely her. dog. Uh, good doggy, says Mr. Wit 30. <laughs> Uh, Gordon says, Rosie, we received last Friday uh, a rescue tiny three-year-old chocolate cocker spaniel. She's even named Coco Bean. <laughs> there is no off switch. No. <laughs> well, you, uh, Gordon Rankin. Gordon knows all about cocker spaniels. He's already got two. So. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Congrats, Gordon. Um, we, for those of you who have dogs, what I'm about to say will not be surprising. But when we first got Rosie, I thought our life had ended. You're hilarious. Now, I literally cannot imagine life without her. It's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, she's amazing. She is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Happy days. Uh, right. Um, uh, Andrew Pickup. Hey, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for the wine, mate. Andrew came. Oh, yes. Andrew came to our, um, our first experience day. Yeah. And, uh, very kindly sent us some very nice wine. Yeah. So thank you. It's brilliant. Thank it, you, buddy. It was enjoyed. Cheers, buddy. I uh, figured I had to heed the number of times Mick has said front of the note and upgrade my three knob Cali 76. It was decided by fate and I managed to get number 23 of the special TPS run. Oh, wow. No cue, just love. Nice. Legend. Cali 76, yeah. I mean, what a fantastic thing. <sighs> Doesn't get much better than that. What a fantastic thing. And so the, the point of saying front of the note is... If you run it with a bit of the dry signal in, you get the front of your note back, which you may want or you may not want, but it's nice to have the option. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Nice to hear from you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, the Bexeller, the Bexeller says, Hey guys, I know direct tones aren't your favourite, but your insight is always appreciated. Some of us mere mortals can't turn up like we want to. And as Dan said, that's the problem. Thanks again. Totally. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Me and Dan don't do very many gigs anymore. That's mm. that's the truth of the matter. Mm. And I think if we did, we would probably be facing 
these problems more often than we are. That said, mm -hmm. the gigs that we do do, I don't have anyone telling me to turn down. No. So I, I was out in, where was it? Uh, Cheltenham mm. uh, a few weeks ago when I had dinner with the friends. We walked past three venues with three live bands. Awesome. All of them cranking well, loud. Making noise. And it was wonderful. Yeah. So this, you know, there's I still... I would also say that the reason I left my last band was because it was too, too impressively loud. loud. Yeah, 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 I mean, right. it was awful. There was yeah, no yeah. dynamic in the band at all. Yeah. And, there's a difference between just being loud for loud yeah, sake yeah, yeah. and being dynamic. That's, that's that's what it's about. It's about light yeah, and shade yeah, and yeah. having the power to have the light and shade. Indeed. And have somewhere to go. But what so funny, listen to the radio this morning. Everyone in media at the moment is talking about attention span. Not just at the moment, but obviously it's a big... The way the internet has sort of chopped stuff up. They were actually talking about Adele as... Asked Spotify not to shuffle her record. Right. They, she wants people to listen to it yeah, yeah. and they had a few people on going that ship has sailed love um <laughs> people are going to consume media how they want you know no one's got an attention span anymore no one has got the time to sit down and listen to a record huh but just after six <laughs> thanks dan dan came over on saturday night we talked last week about i'd listened to a classical record for the first time in mm. ages mm. symphony fantastique by berlioz and i put it on i said dan listen to this and I, I had to go and run the dog around outside and I put it on and I bet you were going, can you turn it up a bit? And then when the flipping... As the, yeah, it all comes in. When it like, all comes in, it's yeah, like... Man. And people don't have the... A, digital audio streamed into headphones and little um, thingy boxes can't handle that dynamic yeah. range. They just, they can't do it. And B, who the hell's got the time to sit there and listen to a 50-minute recording? It is a... It's a different experience. It's it's something that you can't do passively. Yeah. You've got to be actively involved in sitting down and experiencing it, you know? Unless you're, you know, making martinis and you've got it on, it's just like lovely. Yeah, if it is but, background music, let it be background music. Yeah, yeah. But if you're going to sit down, put the vinyl on and just sit down and just, you know, I... I anyway, sorry. Yeah, uh, um, so... Uh, no, uh, the Beck Seller... It is a problem when you can't turn up. So you need to find another solution. And if that's the solution and it works and it keeps you playing, brilliant. Happy days. Yeah. The happiest of days. Yep. MT, it's me. Um, hey, Dan and Mick, happy Monday, if that such a thing exists. Indeed it does. exists. You're twisting my melon, man. Um, was that them? Was that the happy Mondays? It was. Yeah. Bez. He only danced. He didn't sing. No, but didn't he, he did say you're twisting my melon. No, anyway. Oh, I think he had Sean, maracas. Sean Ryder, wasn't it? You're probably right. I don't know. I don't know. That Dan could be right. He could be right. I'm not right. Uh, God, I need to breathe, mate. I'm out of breath. Um, I was wondering if you guys have played around with using a tape recorder, says MT. Uh, Tascam Porter Studio, for example, mm. as an overdrive. Interesting. The first delay I ever used was at my... When I was a kid... A uh, really good mate, um, Millsy, Andrew Mills. Millsy. Mills, Millsy. Ando. <laughs> anyway, uh, his dad owned a hi-fi shop and he had this amazing reel-to-reel. -reel. And Andrew was really tech and he turned the reel-to-reel -reel into a tape delay. Oh, wow. But we used the preamp in the reel-to-reel -to, -reel to get some overdrive. And I'd come over and I had my Kramer, my little um, Kramer yeah. Striker 2. Oh, striker by Kramer, I should say. Yeah. No way for a Kramer. And I'd plug into this tape delay and he'd crank it. And that's all the all the distortion and everything was from the preamp and the tape delay. And of course you have this tape echo. And I would sit there for hours just How making cool. whale noises and stuff. You know, it was, cool. it was brilliant. So only when I was a kid, but oh man, some astonishing sounds there. And of course, we you know, we talk about the preamp and the... Um, the tape echo such as the uh, yeah the EP3, EP3 or and all the, that stuff the and they can make RE201. wonderful wonderful drives yeah. actually I wonder if there's a bit of interest there because loads of that old recording tech is you know salvageably cheap uh, some of it that, that 
it, that's famous is expensive, but there's plenty of that old recording tech that you could probably pick up for next to nothing. Yeah. Might be a good way to get into mods and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interestingly, the Strymon Volante has the um, drum echo setting. It's also got a tape setting, but it's also got a higher fi studio tape setting, hasn't it? Yeah. For its delay sounds. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Very good. TB Kenny. TB Kenny. Kenny. Uh, <laughs> I just recently received my Sunface, which is an RCA Bart version. It sounds epic, fully cranked, but there's no cleanup curve. Anything less than full volume on my telly drops to nothing instantly. What's going on here? So as soon as you roll back anything from your telly... All the overdrive is supposed to go away. That's what First Face does. But it, you should still have the transient there, so it shouldn't. You shouldn't lose all the volume as well. It might be that you've got a because all the thickness and the overdrive and all the massive is going away. It might feel like all the volume's gone away as well. Um, but it should just clean up nicely. There is uh, inside your yes. sun face uh, an internal resistance, input resistance yep. control, which you can tweak backwards and forwards, which will affect that relationship. Indeed, very much so. And if it's got a sundial with a bias knob, that will also affect that relationship. Yep, absolutely. Anything more to no, add to that, you Dan? nailed it, mate. Well done. Yeah, so good. Tweak, tweak those two knobs and you, you might find there's quite a significant difference. But one of the great things about the sun face and great fuzz faces in general is they do exactly what you say when you turn them down. If you don't want that, go for a tone bender. And don't think that by don't think that the volume, that, that your volume knob, relates to the volume of the pedal. It really doesn't. It's like. You know, you're not going to turn down fifty percent, and then your your pedal's going to be fifty percent quieter. It doesn't work like that. Mm. You go back to nine, from ten to nine, and and then all the gain's gone. Yeah. And it's literally, you know, tiny degrees. So just be really sensitive. With, it, with your volume control. Interesting with strats too. On a strat, I've, I pretty much never go below about seven, depending on what the pedal is, maybe six. But on a Les Paul or my Casino, I can be down to two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it still be plenty loud enough. Strat's completely gone below five for me personally. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, Albus Band. Hello, hey, mate. He says, Aaron, my leggings, I hope you're well, and I thought I'd share a new combo that's working well with my setup. JHS Twin 12 and a Walrus 385. Oh, Give lovely. We like the Twin 12. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And the Walrus. Yeah. Fantastic. I like the Super Bolt as well that JHS Super does. Super Bolt's magic. Yeah, yeah. That was this real surprise, that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice. Well done. 385. Love the 385 by Walrus. If you've not heard that, give it a listen. It's a take on the old Cinema Amp Overdrive. Um, very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, Brian Garcia. New cab day, says Brian. Oh, nice. New cab day. I just ordered a Stagecraft D-style cab that I'll load with WGS12L and a Rock 1265B. That was an interesting combination. I'd like to hear that. Uh, using a harness that lets me go back and forth between the two or combine them. Thanks, nice. Mick, for your cab advice in prior Q&As. That sounds like a really nice cab, that, Brian. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's so funny when you see those Dumble style cabs. Mm. The two rock one by twelve, especially. I mean, there's almost no back on it. Yeah, right. It's just it's, so open. Yeah, yeah. With the, the oval cutout. Yeah, my Bob Burke one by twelves have got that big oval yeah. cutout. It's it's a thing. On that note, some people were saying, well, of course the tube amp sounds better from Friday's video. It's way louder because the dB meter was reading louder for the tube amp. Mm. Actually, where we were stood, it was roughly the same. I think what might have been happening was, number one, the amp was nearer. Yeah. Number two, the amp is almost entirely open back, Hot Rod Deluxe, mm -hmm. whereas that PA cab is designed to shoot forward and shoot forward only. Yeah. So I think the dB meter was probably getting more out of the back of the Hot Rod, which made it seem like it was much louder. Where we were sat, they were ordinarily nice. similar. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, DJT? DJT. I just met Roman of Schnobeltone with his recent line of pedals, including the nifty buffer bypass for switching in and out pedals that don't play well with buffers. He's a super nice guy. Hope to see some on TPS. Yeah, we like Roman. Yeah. We met him a few times at NAMM shows and yeah. things. I like what he's done. He's just quietly been doing his own thing, brought out a range of cool stuff. The quiet like achiever. It. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Um, so we met him at NAMM and uh, NAMM's, of course, in America. 
So I'm tangenting here. Yeah. And we've got some American news. Oh, nice done. You yeah. like that? Yeah. So on the QT, this is for all of our um, Q&A fans on a Monday, VCQ fans on a Monday. Something's happening tomorrow. Something's happening. Called yeah. That Pedal Shop. Kind of a big deal. It is a bit of a big deal, but we're not we're not doing a big fanfare launch because we want to just let it out into the world quietly while it gets up and running. Um, as those of you who watch regularly will know, we have preferred retailer links. Anderson's in the UK, Pedal Empire in Australia, and it's been a couple of people in the US, either Sweetwater or Rift City when they were going. We have had the opportunity of working with a partner with fairly serious reach in the US. Mm -hmm. They're called Retail Solutions, and they have four distribution centres dotted across the US. And what, what are we offering, Dan? So when you get there, it'll say that pedal shop. It's us, but it's fulfilled and supplied by them. Most of your favourite brands will be in there, and there'll be more as time goes on. And the cool things are? Oh, so many. Um, the cool things are we've got... 95% coverage of the lower 48 states yes within and generally with it if it's in stock if it's in stock one to two days yeah so that's pretty serious fast free shipping over 50 dollars yeah um and customer service by people who know what they're talking about yeah on yeah, the end very of the phone cool. so it's a big deal for us i mean it's a leap into something pretty massive mm. um and the point of doing it is, as you know, we do that preferred retailer stuff to earn money because what we don't do on TPS is take money to feature stuff or do any product placement or anything like that or sponsorship. And it just funds us and it helps us do more with the show because... We need to pay Dougie. We need to pay Dougie. <laughs> Dougie, Dougie. If you've been with us since the beginning, you will have seen the ambition of the show grow and grow and grow. And we've got some big, big ideas for what we'd really like to do, but those things are quite expensive. So we do need to make a bit more money. We do make money off the merchant stuff, which is how we pay the bills, but we need to make significantly more money <laughs> to do what we want to do next. So, um, so yeah, look out for that pedal shop. It'll go live. I think we're going to say 10 a.m. UK time tomorrow, which is sometime in the early afternoon. I think it is uh, 10 a.m. EST. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Eastern, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so, yeah, 10 a.m. in New York, but it'll be... Uh, it's 3 o'clock here. here. 3 p.m. Yeah. here, yeah. We missed anything, Dan? Um, I don't believe so. The, oh, the other thing is there'll be a bit of content on the site, so when you get there, uh, we'll build that as it as it goes, but there will be... It'll be quite a content-rich environment, so there'll be lists of stuff to look at, links to videos, tips and tricks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We want to build that over time yeah. so that it's not just a, a shop, it's... Um, you know, it's a good it's a good resource for information. Will you be able to buy TPS merch? Not yet. That may come in time. Yeah. At the moment, it's pedals and stuff, and you know all the stuff you would expect. Yeah, that's great. It's exciting. So yeah, let us know. Let us know what you think. Have a look tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Mick's done an amazing job. Mick and Catherine have just knocked it out of the park. Um, I've made coffee on the occasions that I'm in. Actually, now I've poured coffee. And not always very well. <laughs> yeah, so uh, have a look, see what you think. Um, we'll see. Yeah. As always with TPS, it's like, let's push it into the water, see if it floats. Ah! <laughs> Insert Titanic joke here. Um, Eric. <laughs> Move over, love. There's plenty of room on that door. No, you know what? I'm good. Eric Zenhausen, sorry, it's a bit of a macabre joke about the Titanic. Everyone always takes a mick out of the Titanic, forgetting that lots of people lost their lives on the Titanic. They did. Yeah, Catherine's come in to say you got all that wrong. <laughs> Just please don't say any more. Did you say it was US only? Oh, I didn't yeah, say, yeah. did you say it was US only? It's US only. Yeah, we did, we did for, our, for our American friends, Maybe US we needed, only. Maybe we needed to make it more okay. explicit. So this, this is US only? Yes. US only, only. In the United States of America. Yeah. Yes. Good. Um, Eric Zenhausen. Cheers. A guitar player that's recently set up a direct board with a simplifier bass station. I already own a lot of guitar effects. Which guitar pedals work well with bass? Are there any must-have specific bass pedals? Well, Eric, I'm glad you asked. Oh, very good. Very good. 
Yeah, so these are the pedals that we used uh, filming with the bass. There's a couple of new pedals from Ampeg, and oh my goodness, they sound amazing. Um, of course, the Ripley Fall, as always, just continues to inspire and be epic. It just the the chorus and phaser on the bass, far yeah, out, man. It's not a specific bass pedal. That I, I don't know if Jam actually... Jam do do some bass-specific pedals. We just use the guitar one. Sounds awesome. Sounds amazing. But for me, bass essential pedals are compressor. Mm -hmm. And for that, we've used that Ampeg one, and I think it sounds brilliant. Amazing. It certainly made the playing experience really nice. Yep. Notice I do that when I play the bass. Um, a bass really overdrive. Really high. <laughs> and bass overdrives are interesting because they work at a different range of frequencies than guitar overdrive, so yeah. it probably is worth getting a bass specific overdrive. Um, a filter. So we use the Source Audio Spectrum and it's just ace fun to have a filter, whether it's Bootsy style stuff or... Well, all right. Well, all right. Or an octave down. Well, all right. Uh, which is just great. I mean, you wouldn't think... What's great about that one is... <laughs> it's Bootsy's Uncle Dave, isn't it? All right. All right. Um, uh. It also, because of, because of the nature... I mean, I don't know, understand how these things work, but when you play the, the octave down on one of those filters, it also puts a bit of, like, gritty, synthy, horrible overdrive on it, and it's just fantastic. So, compressor, overdrive, and filter is... is what the, these two non-bass players would uh, would go for. And then we added the chorus. And if you do your Pino Palladino harmonics, Jacko harmonics, it's like, oh my God, I am Jacko Palladino. Pino Pesorius. <laughs> <laughs> what was they calling me in the last video? Pino Cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's what we're, that, those would be our suggestions. Um, we'll get the padster on, uh, Paddy Blight, who play, plays bass in the TPS band, to explain that properly uh, at some point. And indeed play the bass properly at some point. But for now, Dan and I are really enjoying slapping the bass. Slapping the bass. It's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, the buddy system. Long time bedroom player. I started a band a year ago. Nice. Finally playing my first gig at the age of 30. A punk band with lots of pedals. Come on! Any first time gig advice? Yes. Um, don't drink until after the gig. Would be my first bit of advice because you can get really, really excited and then, uh, yeah, just do yourself a favour. Keep clear headed. Afterwards, go for your life. I don't know how you actually do this, that what I'm about to say, but you've got to find a way of doing all the work beforehand that needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it comes to the time where no more work can be done, stop worrying about it. Yeah. And, and I say this after 30 years of not being able to do that. And I've just in the last year or two, thanks in part to a fairly major psychological shift in my brain in general, I'm now able to go, there's the cutoff, now we go. Yeah. And whatever stage of prep you're at at that point, you know, you might not be able to quite remember the chords in one of the songs or you might still need your song sheet or iPad or something to remember the lyrics or you're not quite sure about this sound or, you know, you're a bit nervous. You, you, you just have to let it go and in tandem with that, remember, the audience are on your side. Yeah, they're willing you They on. want you to be good. Yeah, they really do. Um, so, yeah, just try a bit like probably, don't know if you've had a wedding day. Dan and I have both had wedding days. The thing that everyone says to you, oh, it was such a lovely day, darling. It was. The things people always say to you is, try and remember it. Freak my mum out, though. <laughs> try and enjoy it. Because you can be all up in your head about all the stuff that's going on. And actually, what you just need to be is in the moment and enjoying it. And I would say of your first gig, if you can do that, you've done pretty well. It will go so quick. Yeah, it will. You'll be stunned yeah. how fast the gig goes. Yeah. So, yeah, as Mick said, get all your work done after that point and then just relax and have fun. Yeah. Because it is fun. It is. So my brother started uh, gigging again. And he calls me and says, why didn't you tell me it was this much fun? Mm. You know, 
And I said, because then you would have been poor like me. <laughs> um, but he's like, he is stunned at just how much fun it is. It's, it's the yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's one of the most fun things you can do. So, yeah. Yeah. Don't stress about it. Have fun. But yeah, go let it. us know how you go. Yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah. And good luck. Yeah, good luck, mate. Good luck. What a great thing. What a great thing. Uh, Tim Good. Hi, DNM. Tim Good. Uh, the other guitar player in my band uses a Helix, and I use either my Trainer 40 or 60 Watt DeVille, depending on the venue. It's always a struggle to hear him, no matter what we did. Do you have any tips? Buy your friend a trainer. Um, it's, oh, I, I'll, uh, it's, really, it's really hard. It's really hard. It's one of those things. Right. Okay. If, if there's any consolation, I can barely hear Dan when we do the TPS band gigs. That's just about monitoring. Yeah. It's, if I'm stood here and I've got my amp blowing my head off and Dougie's cymbals blowing my head off and I've got my monitor whacking at me for vocals, sometimes I can barely hear Dan. Yeah. And you just got to trust that it's okay. Yeah. Um, however, I do think there's an additional problem with the kind of sounds those digital things produce, mm -hmm. which is a very weird mid-range and it's always weird for me personally. Um, it, they one of the reasons they sound so great is because they sound pretty hi-fi. Loads of bass, always loads of bass, and a weird treble because it's filtered. But the mids are quite often pretty scoopy, which is one of the reasons they sound so damn good because they sound like produced music. Mm. But in order to be heard, you need those ugly mid-range peaks. And I'm not saying those devices aren't capable of that because clearly they are. They've got very full and capable EQ systems. I just think it takes a brave person to dial them in because they tend not to come set that way. Sure. And, and so on stage monitoring, how you're hearing that, is it, you know, is it directly in the front of the house and you're getting a bit through the monitors? Because that can be problematic. Um, I think ultimately, though, oh, man. If you... What am I trying to say? Your sound could be too thick and massive and completely drowning them out. If you, if what you're after is two guitar sounds that are going to really complement each other, and and that's what you're worried about, then you, you know you need to get into a rehearsal room together and yeah. work that out. Treat it as one instrument. Exactly. If what you're, if, but if you've already done that and it sounds great, but things change when you get live on stage, then you need to look at how his sound is being produced on stage, and it might just be that he needs to, his full range speaker to be turned up or you need some more of that in your monitors whatever mm -hmm. um, you just need to sort of approach it um, sort of as systematic as you can trying to you know get those tones to work so that you can hear what's going on as well it is challenging with that stuff um, it's really interesting right this conversation I had with my very dear friend Paul Stacy about I said, why is it that when I go to a sound check and the drummer can be belting 10 shades of crap out of his kit, some guys are going, yeah, man, that sounds really good. And Kick drum then, like it's going to take your yeah, heart out. Yeah, it's like, what you? And then I go, eh, and it's like, oh, it's too loud, turn it down. Because that sound is not a pleasant yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot Kick of... drums all 50 hertz, 4K and 10K, just, isn't it? It's nice. Exactly. But where yeah. the guitar sits in the mid-range, ah, it's, it's not pleasant. The guitar sounds that work in those mixes and they just sit beautifully aren't pleasant. What happens, though, I think with a lot of that stuff that we can turn on at home and everything, it just sounds so lovely. That n lovely sound doesn't necessarily translate when you put it in a band context. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we're trying to get across with the band things. You know, making that stuff work on its own. Some of those sounds can be really harsh, but when you hear them in the mix, it's like it just makes perfect sense. Um, so, you know, it might just it, he might just need to dial back some bottom end, put a bit more mids in there. It could be that simple. But yeah, yeah. best of luck, mate. Best of luck. It's a, it, yeah. it is a challenge. Adam Loris says, I think the thing about monitoring at a gig is you just need to accept that it'll sound weird yeah. and bad, and you won't be able to hear everyone. It's sad but true. Yeah, I think that's right, um, Adam. And the more you do it, the more you kind of get used to that. Yeah. And the more you sort of... I, I don't know what the analogy is, but it's not a perfect... That's probably why there was so much 
um, I'm trying to put this in a positive way without using the phrase butt hurt. Um, <laughs> there were so many people passionately defending their approach to direct sounds, and I think one of the reasons is for that is because it sounds so flipping good. Yeah, yeah, it sounds yeah. like produced monitors and um, produced music in your IEMs. And, a, you know, a really belting band doesn't sound like that. A belting band can sound pretty angular and difficult sometimes. Yeah. And I think, uh, sorry, um, I've lost you. Adam, I think, Adam, that's exactly what you're saying. And you do get used to that. Yeah. But then if you, it, again, musical style makes such a difference. You know, I totally understand why a lot of metal bands have gone direct only because that cacophony mm. of constant noise, I mean, I'm not saying metal bands don't have dynamic, but a lot of them do play with quite a lot of, hammering stuff quite a lot of the time it's just horrible it's horrible to be in the middle of it any sort of volume but a, a different style of music played with more kind of really serious light and shade diff whole different experience best of luck mate yeah yeah um atb pop atb pop hello cheers mates just wanted to say thanks for making my overnight shifts better over the last few months ah oh, bless you i'm going back to days next week and looking forward to getting to watch tps and see the sun again good on you well done mate good much respect for anyone who does shift work that is hard boy oh boy yeah not not just the nocturnal nature of it but also the effect it has on you you know, your relationships and your family and the people around you and all that. It's tough work, tough work. When I was when I was playing Friday, Saturday nights, and there were late gigs, right? Especially in, in Australia. But even the gigs are doing out here. And we might have a, you know, we'd finish a gig at one in the morning, pack up, and there's a two-hour drive home. I wouldn't get home until four, yeah. right? And you do that uh, on a Friday, Saturday night. There is, you don't wake up until mid-afternoon Sunday the weekend with you know it's gone it, yeah. it has impacts everywhere yeah. to, you know working like that a massive massive respect for for anyone that does it yes yeah. yeah um hope you enjoy being back on the days ATB yeah. thanks for your thanks for everything uh Stephen Joseph he says main thing I've learned from you both is don't compromise just for convenience be inspired keep it up man that perfect well done I did, reading through the comments on Friday's video, and I, I try to not be disrespectful to anybody because everyone does it their own way, and I, that is the most important thing, and mm. it's totally cool. It's all good. That's that's the that's the start point. But after that, it does feel like some people hate playing, because they know what you mean. It's like oh god, I've got to walk up the stairs. I've got to carry. Oh, gee, why do I want to carry my amps? And then the, the drummer hates me, and I don't get paid enough, and. And then I've got to drive three hours home, so there's just no point carrying an amp. And I'm like, wow, wow, okay. Um, we should be having a different conversation. I don't think the amp is the problem, problem here. <laughs> so, yeah, I think you're right. You know, we, Dan and I are in a very, very fortunate position of being able to do this thing purely, purely because we love it. Yeah. You know, it's not a job. Um, it's not like we're getting hired to go and play, you know, in a pit or a whatever. It's purely for fun and enjoyment. And... I don't know about you lot, but there are many areas in my life in which I am forced to compromise. Yeah. Largely through income. And it's like, well, why would I compromise this thing that I love more than almost anything in the world? Why? Yeah. I don't get it. I don't get why you would why you would compromise. Yeah. We're here for a good time, not a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly understand practicality. Going on tour, tour manager says, nope. You go, OK, I'll find another way. But if I've got my car and I'm driving myself and I can stick a 412 in the boot. Hello. Damn tootin' it's going in there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and the sound person looks at you funny and you say, if I tilt it this way, will that work? And maybe I can buy you a drink, sir. <laughs> and you just, you have that merry dance, don't you? That's how that works. Uh, I, I remember um, I went Tin Spirits with this gig in London, this tiny little pub. Dave and I both had the mattresses on stage and we were giving it the beans. It was just great. And uh, there's like an old boozer, and these guys at the bar, you know, with their flagons of, you know, <laughs> ale. <laughs> and, um, and we knew that that gig was just for us, yeah. no one else. We had the best time. I remember getting off stage. I was with Dougie. And this guy gets up and goes, Oi, I like some bit of the old music. <laughs> bit of the old music. 
Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> that was wonderful. Yeah. It ought to be fun, didn't it? It ought to be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Macchiato says, this show just reeks with wisdom. <laughs> Thank you both so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. That's classic. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Wisdom's one word for it. Age is another, <laughs> perhaps. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um Right, moving along, um, Vibas Patil. Vibas, hey, buddy. Really nice to hear from you. He says, gents, I've got a one-off gig coming up. Well, I've no amp and I don't have a modeler. What do you think about going uh, direct front of house using a cab sim of the Big Sky? Uh, tone shaping pedals on my board, Unit 67, King of Tone, Friedman, B-E-O-D. Um, I didn't know the Big Sky, Big yeah. Sky had a cab yeah, sim. has a cab sim in it. Uh, use it. That'll do 90% of your work for you yeah. i would imagine yeah yeah and then let the let the engineer as long as you can get something workable back through your mons so you can hear what's going on let them worry about it yep yeah great option yeah have fun buddy that's the thing you know when you are when you've got a limited range of options yeah uh then you've just got to go with it you've yeah. got, you just got to go and try and have fun yeah, yeah. Or indeed, no, don't try and have fun. Just have, yeah, yeah. There is no try. There is do there or is do no not, as a friend of ours once said. Yeah. <laughs> so have fun. Very good. Uh, Jeffrey Raddick. Hello, Jeffrey. Thanks, gents. Thank you, Jeffrey. When I play quietly through my pedal board rig, I'm either often too quiet or too distorted. And the distortion is unpleasant. Yes. 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 Any suggestions? turn up yeah either turn the distortion down or the guitar see what's happening there is you're hearing all the mucky muck you're hearing all the mucky muck you're hearing all the stuff that's produced in the pedal the overdrive which is very nice can be very nice but what's then not happening is you're not getting that harmonic interplay of yeah. what needs to happen afterwards which is you know hopefully a speaker and some stuff to give it a bit of richness feedback through the guitar and all of that so that's what you're missing there um i guess some form of compression could help mm. um and if you get a compressor run it after your overdrives make sure there's a bit of dry mix in there that might give you a bit more feel and a bit more sponge and in your case uh if you run it with less mix it might be that it takes away some of the unpleasantness of the front of those notes mm. maybe but if you can get a little bit more volume a little bit less gain that tends to be where it starts to... Yeah. Yeah. It'll make a big difference. Um, just And it it's all comes back to understanding gain stages. Because with your distortion on 10 and your amp on 10 is a very different thing than distortion on 10, amp on 2. Um, you know, they, they th there's interaction with yeah. those gain stages and understanding that the first gain stage is here. So... Yeah, if you get to grips with what, what's happening gain staging as far as your rig is concerned, then it'll really help you get on top of why certain things will sound much at a certain volume. At another volume, it'll sound too strident and harsh. It's just about understanding gain stages. It's all interactive. Yeah, that's the thing. It's an ecosystem, isn't it? Totally. That's one of those things why having pedals at your feet is such a great thing when you're at a gig, because if you make an adjustment on your amplifier, no doubt you'll probably have to adjust something with you know a couple of your gain stages as well um you know w when we do gigs and things you know, sort of pick up towards the end of the night and drummer starts hitting a bit harder bass player thinks gonna give it some i think i need another octave down they, exactly yeah. <laughs> and you might need to adjust things yeah just be aware that adjust one thing it affects everything else yeah yeah i feel your pain though definitely feel your pain i've had a m revelation of of late that I pretty much always use too much gain in my whole life. And right. it's like easing back on it and all of a sudden you can hear the guitar on the edge of the pick and all those things. And actually, if you listen to some of your favourite records and you listen to them sort of actively, as it were, you might be surprised how some of those massive distortion sounds you thought were there actually aren't that massive and distorted. Yeah. Yeah. Also, soak it in delay and reverb. That helps a lot. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Good luck, mate. Um, if you want some ideas on delay, watch this shy, de this shy Days, this Friday show... Um, Happy shy days. Where we do, we give you six suggestions of how to use delay in your band on the guitar. It's actually, I'm really pleased with how it went. 
Oh man, it was so much fun. Yeah, if it edits together as as well as it felt when we were doing it, then I think it will be a really useful show. Yeah. Yeah, and some nice noises too. Indeed. We have um, a thousand people watching us at the moment. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for hanging around with us. It's lovely. Yeah, yeah. How amazing. It is amazing. Uh, it will never cease to be amazing. <laughs> LC Vol 73. LC Vol 73 says, Hey guys, are you still using the Princeton? What are your thoughts on swapping the speaker for a more headroom? Uh, either a 10 or a 12. And what speaker would you choose? Um, we're definitely still using the Princeton. I want to get a Celestian Gold in there. I would definitely love the 10 inch format. Um, Princeton with a 12 inch speaker is of course wonderful and we know loads of people have great results with that but there's something about that 10 inch sound with that thing. I just think it's wonderful. So yeah, we're going to get a, a Celestian Gold and slap it in there. But we, it's just such yeah. a classic amplifier. We had to have it as part of our arsenal. Yes, if you want more headroom, what you need to look for is a speaker with a high, higher power handling capacity and one that has a higher efficiency yes. or sensitivity rating. Mm -hmm. um, the power bit's easy to understand because that will be expressed as a wattage. The sensitivity uh, is expressed as dB at one meter. So you'll see, you know, I don't know, it might be 97 dB if it was a Celestian Greenback or it might be 100 dB if it's a... Uh, Celestian Gold, I think, off the top of my head, could be wrong. The higher that dB rating, the more efficient that speaker is and the more volume you'll get out of it for the same amount of oomph from the amp, which is to suggest that maxing out the power and the efficiency will be, be the best thing possible. There's a cutoff point where the amp start will start to sound sterile because what you end up with is a 600-watt PA speaker with yeah, no love yeah, in it yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, yeah, there's that's, a bunch of options. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge in those really high headroom amplifiers is to make them sound like the amplifiers with character. That's yeah. why... Yeah, that's why the, the 2-Rock needs to be turned up. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's... And the high watt, you can still get at a reasonable volume where it still has loads of headroom but still has... There's a character about yeah. it still. It doesn't sound like you're plugging into a PA. Yeah. Check out some of the um, Eminence uh, speakers. They do some nice yeah. higher powered ones. Um, but... Uh, we're pretty settled on the Celestian Alnico Gold. It is expensive, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's just yeah, magic Surprise, surprise. David Austaloni. David Austaloni. No question from you, so I will just check if BV has sent me a question from you. Steve Rennie asks, uh, meet Feast later? Um, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, no, no, we're not uh, filming tomorrow. I'm not staying at Miss tonight. We're going to... Uh, but I'll have my own solo meat feast, I think, when I get home. <laughs> There's always a meat feast on a Monday night. Um, yeah, okay, nothing from you, David. Hopefully, if there is one, we'll find it in a sec. Apologies if we've missed you. Um, yeah, Ian Fan. Hello, Ian. Hey, Ian. I play in church with IEMs and I use the Iridium. Not my favourite, but it works. Mm. If I were to use an ISO box, what is a good con what is a good option for the long cable run? Okay, so you need a long ah, speaker cable. Long speaker cable, yeah. Um... <sighs> Yes, the, the the long speaker cable is interesting because if you think of, it's all about the resistance in the cable, right? Um, because what's happening with the output transformer, uh, transforming it from, um, <sighs> transforming the, the power from the valves into power to, to move the speaker. And, you know, whether it's 4 ohms, 16 ohms, uh, 8 ohms. My suggestion would be that if you've got a seriously long uh, run from your amp to your ISO cab, if your amplifier's got a 16 ohm setting and you can find a 16 ohm speaker that you like, um, it will be least affected by any resistance in the cable. Um, I mean, 8 ohms should be fine. A, a little bit more wary of 4 ohms because, like, percentage-wise, it will be the most affected. Um, yeah, there you go. I'm going to say demo, demo one of these. They're great. Um, ISO cab is going to cost you a fair bit of money. That's expensive. 
so demo one. Yeah. Have a listen to it. I watched the uh, Country Music Awards yesterday, Sunday. Right. Everyone had Oxbox. Seriously. On top of their amps. Wow. Yep. Interesting. Yep. So that means you can run your head into it. You can run it at zero, I think. Please tell me you can run it at zero. I think you can run it at zero, silently. Ah, oh, they all using deluxe reverbs. Quite a lot of deluxe reverbs, quite a lot of orange amps. Because that's what that's yeah. rolled on, right? The, yeah, the speaker. And I think that, that will... One. So then that offers you, you... It's a little more convoluted because you have to use an app with it and all the rest of it. Actually, you don't have to use the app. You can load it in there and you don't need to take the app with you. You can send a really nice balanced XLR to you. Can you? Yes. Oh, that's a really good point. I'm not sure if you can. No. You have to send a jack <laughs> to your... Is it balanced, though? Front of house. TRS? It must be. I can't believe that it's not. No. To your front of house. Um, and it sounds really, really, really good. In my opinion, I would ha much happier use my guitar amp head into that than I would the Iridium, personally, just per purely personally speaking yeah that could be a good halfway house and yeah. um it's an amazing bit of kit yeah so uh, it, it's really wonderful i think so my recording solution that i have at home is a grossman iso cab and i've got the most amazing results out of that thing the thing that's important to know though is that it's not completely silent it reduces the level by about 30 plus db which is substantial that should be enough i mean you your singer's louder than that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Without and a microphone. Yeah, yeah. But it's not like it, it won't be no. nothing. It's, it's still a bit there. So my point being, if you find a 16 ohm or even an 8 ohm speaker and you've got to run a long cable, that'll be fine. Uh, I'm less, about 4 ohms more challenging because the any amount of resistance in that is going to have more an effect on the... Um, the loading between the Apple transformer over the amplifier and the speaker. Um, but yeah, just run the you know, 8 ohms and 16 ohms in the back of the amplifier and you'll be golden. Hope that helps. Yeah, good luck. Um, David Lemon, he says, hello from Sacramento, California. Thanks for everything. Thank you, David. That's very kind of you. And likewise, Sam Webster says, the purpose of this message is to support the show, not to take up time in case it's running out. Oh, mate, that's so kind. Sam, that's very kind of you. Thank, Thank you. you, buddy. That's very kind. Thank uh, you. Ran Zare is on. Hello, Ran. He says, uh, hello, Leggins. You mentioned last VCQ that you both love the Mercury 7. I recently mm. got it, and I'm curious how you use it. Thanks for all you do, and much love. Right. Okay. Mercury 7. Um, the guys from Meris, brilliant, brilliant bunch of guys as well. Uh the algorithm from the, uh, the it's not the algorithm from the Mercury Seven. They they did the they also did the algorithm in the uh, CXM 1978, uh, which is a collaboration between them and Chasebus Chasebus Audio. So anyway, the Meris is a reverb inspired by the reverb sounds from Blade Runner, which is you know, think about those old reverb units that having that all the old um, was it the not, it's not Lesis it's the um, what, what, what? The reverb sounds from Blade Runner, which is what the CXM was also based on. But Oh, different. yes, the What's Lexicon. The Lexicon, thank yeah. you. Um, Can I just say, yes. sorry, on the last question where I'm talking about the Ox, lots of people have chimed in quite rightly. Brooke Chive Official has said the uh, Boss Wazza Tube Amp Expander is also an excellent option. Yes. It is, has more, actually has more um, software options. And loads of people, The Corner, Cosmic KJ, Doug Floyd, um, lots of other people saying uh, Captor X yeah. by Two Notes. Of course, the Captor X. Any, lots and lots of those Two Notes products, definitely worth looking at alongside yeah. the Ox. Jason's Jason's got to come down. He's got one for us to have a cool. play with. So that'd be, yeah. that'd be good. I'm, I'm saying the Ox because it's the one I have the most familiarity with yeah. and I like the interface, etc. Yeah, so. yeah, great interface. Um, where was I? Uh, you were talking about um, uh, the Lexicon two four. Oh yes, so like. yes, the the Meris, um, the yeah. Right, um, it's the most amazing thing. So basically, you've got uh, an ultra plate and an ultra cathedral. So massive plate reverb, massive hall reverb. For standard um, 
Like my favorite thing for just a you know, normal everyday reverb is a plate reverb for guitar. You know, I, I don't like, well, very rarely do I hear a spring emulation on a pedal that I think, oh yeah, that'll do. Because the spring reverbs in guitar amps are so good. But the plate reverbs, astonishing. So normally I will have it on a plate reverb. I will have, for standard, I'll have like no shimmer, no, none of that stuff. And quite warm because uh, there's a lot of detail on the top end of that thing. So it's just one thing to be aware of. Because if you want to do massive soundscape type reverbs, you need that detail. But for, a, for you know, standard, I'm, I'm going out to play whatever. I just need a bit of reverb. Just turn the top end down um, and then and sort of mix to taste. And if you grew up in the 70s, 80s or 90s, especially the 80s or the 90s, you probably heard plate reverb on most of your favourite yeah. guitar tracks on recorded music. That's yeah. why I think it sounds so familiar, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now you can do the same thing with the hall. It's obviously a different sound. I just love the guitar with the with that plate reverb. Now, one thing I'm doing um, with that reverb pedal, because there's a number of different modes, and you know, getting the uh, each knob's got the secondary function on it, and getting the pre delay right, and the modulation, and all that sort of stuff. But oh my goodness, that swell function in that pedal yeah. is, it is inc absolutely incredible. And I like the, uh, yesterday, I was playing with it with my board at home, and I must have been on that for like an hour. And you use that with an expression pedal, yeah? No, I just, no, you put the swell on, right. and you play it, and you go, and it goes, and then I'm, ju and I'm just, so I'm just in Dan Cordland <laughs> doing this stuff, and it's like, Oh, it's just it's like well, there's there's the next album. That's it. That's it. It's just remarkable. I've told Joey he has to get one as well. <laughs> I only ever use two sounds in a digital reverb pedal. One is the plate, like Dan's talking about. So I have two. I have I'll have two presets. One is um, a room, a short room, mm. and I will use that for rock and roll and yeah, just yeah. the the room sound, which I've come to be totally addicted to. And then the second one will be a bigger plate. So if you play something with a bit more space in the mix and you've got to play some big chords or some long sustained notes, a nice plate. And even better, if you've got a expression pedal on the depth, you can then, yeah. you can ride that as to what it is you want to be playing. So if you are playing something, you know, the, the mix gets a little denser and you're playing something with a bit more complex, you can just ride the volume, the, the reverb level back a bit. And then when it comes to that section where everyone goes, breathe out or you play a big thing with you know three notes over eight bars reverb yeah yeah and well you you'll hear a little bit of it even though we do it with delay you'll hear a little bit of that effect in friday's show yeah where that ambience in a sparse mix has really got room to do its thing mm. you know sure if you're playing the dear old shoegaze or some psychedelia or other, <laughs> other really cool music that's just drowned in reverb, then yes, you want loads of reverb. But in sort of general rock and pop music mm. with a dense mix, lots of reverbs are problematic. Yeah. Certainly if it's loud. So anyway, enjoy. Yeah, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Enjoy. And then um, I suppose the Mercury 7 does all those octave... All the shimmer stuff, all the harmony stuff. It's... That's, that's the reason. That's the bonkers. reason. That, so I've the, that has replaced the CXM on my board for doing because I'm getting the sounds together for do, for this new band, and you know obviously I love the CXM. But I just wanted some more modulation, some more options with the reverb. And I went, oh hang on, and I put it on. It's like that's it, and yep. all that swell stuff is. Oh man, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Really wonderful. Uh, Guitar Moog. Guitar Moog says, Salut. 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 Uh -huh. I have a Soulmate, Soulmate Spring Reverb, which needs 12 volts AC. I've put a wall wall under my board, but it causes noise in other pedals. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so... Uh, this man. Either... You, 12 volts AC. Is that the Soulmate? Is that the T-Rex one? Um, That's called Roommate, I think. Oh, yes, of course. So, my 12 volts AC. I'm... Yeah. Oh, yeah, they do do a Soulmate as well. Right. So, yeah, it's a... Oh, man, AC. 
Hang on. Ace. The soulmate is the big. The soulmate is the big uh, acoustic board. The roommate is the reverb, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Regardless. Regardless. Right. So you've got a big transformer on that, and that's you know kicking out loads of EMF and stuff. And that will cause, can cause issues. Um, you either find a place on the board, you know, literally get the board powered up, put that on an extension lead, just that supply, and move it around the board until you find a position that it sounds okay. Um, the only other option really is to find a power supply that has an integrated AC part. Um, and yeah, that's really your only other option, apart from having the that power supply off the board and with that transformer moved far away from the board. And that's not a bad option if what if it's really noisy. Um, it's just not as convenient. But that's yeah. Yeah. You can there's there's things like moo metal that do you, you can do. Do you not do a twelve volt AC adapter? No. No. No, everything we do is DC. Um, can you spell AC, DC? <laughs> well, I love it in the AD, DC. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, good luck with me. It's, it's, it, it's a pain. The, the thing that's a pain is all that stuff, as soon as it gets in there, it goes through um, uh, some sort of rectifier to put it into DC anyway. So it's like I don't understand. Anyway. Yes, good luck. Is Best a, of luck to you, sir. Is it sir. a way of getting more current? That you can be. Yeah, you can be. That's often the problem, isn't yeah. it? Um, we just should mention Joe Heffer. Joe Heffer says, please could we have a moment of appreciation for my girlfriend, Rosie, who's uh, just bought me a Proco wrap for Christmas. Ah, oh, legend. Nice. Sounds like a keeper, mate. Yeah, and spoiled the surprise, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it, darling? Uh, oh, it's a rat. <laughs> cool. Very good. Awesome. Uh, nice one, Rosie. Oh, I bet Joe is super happy with his rat. Yeah, well done. Nice. Well done. Um, please apologise to Catherine, says Stephen Fines, uh, for forgetting to put my T-shirt size in the DNM drive order and not responding to her email in time. <laughs> no worries, Stephen. Catherine can be seen uh, stomping up and down the office with snorting unhappy noises out of her nose when people don't respond to emails about T-shirts. <laughs> it's our fault for not making it more clear. Um Anyway, thank you for buying the DNM. Yeah, thank you very much. And we hope that the T-shirt situation has been sorted and you get it in time, um, and you like it. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Just to reiterate, lovely Christmas teas in stock. Yeah, nice Christmas T-shirts. Rudolph the LED nose reindeer. Who, there. who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to be wearing this around the table, with your grand going? I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. My grand won't be saying that. Macabre, insert macabre joke here. Um, <laughs> she would do though. She would. She yeah. would do though. Well, she, she would if it were plain. If it were plain. <laughs> That's enough of that one. That's enough, enough, of, that enough one. of that one. I took Dan's advice uh, on clean boosts after delay, says David Rustad, um, to the extreme and put together a Cali 76, Thorpey Heavy Water, and JHS Colour Box version 2 at the end of the board. I love it. Thank you. Post delay well and done. reverb. So well that, done. Yeah, great. Nice. So what that means is, for anyone who doesn't get that, if you put the boost before your reverb and delay, when you hit the boost, obviously it sends the delay and reverb into more delay and reverb because you're giving it more signal. So you, yeah. your little delay there that you really like, you put a boost in and it goes... Wow. <laughs> hey! Yeah. Whereas if you put the boost after, all it does is make the whole thing louder. Yeah. Uh, and it has, is a different effect. So uh, nice one, David. All comes back to gang staging. Well done, mate. Thank you. Connor Renshaw. Hello, Connor. He says, hello, gents. Recently went to get my dream acoustic, a beautiful Martin 0018. Very nice. I went to your page to find videos on acoustics, and there's Dan playing a very similar 0018. Cheers for great taste. Well, stay tuned for a really great acoustic guitar video. Dan's having an acoustic guitar built at the moment. Yep by uh, the one and only Mr. Johnny Kincaid. Which is very exciting. Actually, I hope that is the trigger to us doing a few more acoustic vids because people have been asking for them. Yeah. You know, bear in mind we are neither Preston Reed nor um, 
uh, Eric Roach, but uh, Preston Roach. We can flap around. Yeah, and we'll do so. Yeah, yep. like a plastic bear on a on a barbed wire fence flapping in the breeze. <laughs> Michael Hedges, I was thinking of as well, and uh, Adrian Leg, I was thinking of. Tommy Emmanuel, I was thinking of. We're none of those people. No, no. Um, HR twenty one. I love you both, says HR21. Thank we you, love mate. you too, HR21. Thank you, mate. I was born in the early 70s, but I didn't grow up listening to the likes of ADDC, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, or anything similar due yeah. to cultural differences. Yeah, so I'm right there with you, mate. Now I get stuck on what to learn to play. Help, please. Oh, that is so interesting. Okay, right. It's really important. I found it really important, at least. Um, when I was growing up and there were loads of people, uh, loads of uh, instructional videos and things to help you play like really common rock songs, but I didn't have any of those in my um, vocab. I didn't know, yeah. you know that stuff. Yeah. So what I did was worked out songs that I was introduced to and that I really liked. Um, and I think one of the really important things when I was growing up is that I did that all by ear. And it sort of it helped me develop my ear. So obviously you're into music. You can learn anything. And it doesn't necessarily have to be yeah. you know, songs. You can take any piece of music that you like and and approach it, work out where to put your fingers to make those sounds on guitar. Um, yeah. There you go. Um, Dan and I were talking just last week about the rich canon of pop music that's just full of great melodies and chords and sounds. So, as he said, you obviously love music, or you at least like music, so learn to play the music that you like. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to be able to play all of it because most of it's flipping hard. But yeah. it's a good, you know, a good start. And if... I don't know. Um, there, when I was studying music, there was this amazing uh, classical musician from Japan. And every year he'd do, he, uh, uh, he'd take like an orchestra piece and work out ways to play it on yeah. guitar. And he'd do things like in the middle of a thing, he'd cross two strings over and he'd make a snare sound and like, and it'd take a year to put this piece together. Wow. Um, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, you could say not having that burden of... That's very true. Um, very true. The, all that stuff that we listen Histrionic to. Histrionic burden. Um, it could be of, of great advantage because you yeah. have the opportunity to do something original and, and free. But yeah, the internet's full of really great learning resources. Yeah. Um, we would recommend truefire.com. I certainly get... Wonderful. Whenever I want to do a course, I usually get it from there. Yeah. Me too. I got my, um, a couple of years ago, got the Pat Martino course from that. Oh, Pat. <laughs> May he rest in peace. Oh, man. Um, good luck, anyway. Yeah, best of luck, mate. Good luck. All the best. Uh, shenanigan Ursus. <laughs> yes. Nice. I thought that was going to be a Uranus joke there, but not quite. Um, from Norway, it says, Do you think a preamp pedal like a Kingsley or Victory V4 could improve the Go Direct experience? Yes. Yes. How much it will improve it is an interesting question. It might, it's a, like I said before, the thing, yeah, sonically, yes, it, it might make a difference. And there's a bunch of stuff that you can do sonically to make a difference. The issue for me was more about playing it... Um, playing at a level where I just didn't feel interaction. Now, it's different when I, if I'm playing at home and I've got, you know, I've, uh, my little Yamaha or the, um, the, the Audio Kitchen Big Trees into a little speaker and I'm right next to it, it's right on my face and I can play and it's, and it's great, but it's, I would never take that stuff to a gig and go, here we go, this is me. You know, it's always, my tone is developed around 
having apps and having the interaction. Yeah. As a practice tool, though, different story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's loads of stuff that you can do. Yeah. But it doesn't change the fundamental thing. Yeah, it doesn't change the problem of there not being a guitar cabinet on stage. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of which, Simon Duncan really, 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 really wants to know what are good enough 2x12 closed back greenback cabs for a JTM45 reissue? Uh, Hendrix, Black Keys, Gary Clark Jr., thanks, and please do more amps and pedals videos. Um, there is one cabinet we would recommend for that, and it is the, I don't even know if they still make it, 2061X Marshall. Um, Sometimes it come it has come with greenbacks and sometimes it comes with um the anniversaries. The anniversary. Mm. So just check. It's a two twelve, looks like a four twelve, and it is a flipping fantastic cab. If you can't find one, don't know where you are, Simon. If you're in the UK, get Paul at Zilla to make you one. Yeah. Um they'll do a range of nice cabinets that'll work well. There's lots of great cabinet companies out there. Um, I speak from experience having owned many Zilla cabinets that Paul uses really, really nice marine grade ply. He box joints them beautifully. He covers them well. They are just great sounding traditional cabinets that are made brilliantly. So I recommend Zilla cabs unreservedly. Yep, if good. you're not in the UK, um, I don't know, you may ship internationally, but it does seem a bit crazy to be shipping a cab internationally. Um, if you're in the US, for example, they are probably equivalent cabinet makers there but failing that that marshall 2061 if you can find one 212 mm -mm. happy days yeah 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 um 1936 marshall 212 is okay i've never loved it truth be told uh best two by 12 we have here is the hughes and kettner one yeah that is a really f unfortunately they don't make that anymore that was the old hughes and kettner vintage uh closed back again marine grade ply greenbacks very nicely made um, shouldn't be that hard, should it? Shouldn't be that hard. It's not that hard, Mark. Spell ADDC. <laughs> Good luck. It will never not be funny. <laughs> Kelvin Mack. Curious about your thoughts about the retrosonic flanger. I've read mm. they've made it a little brighter from the feedback they were getting. Feedback, get it? Um... Yeah, I'm just um, I've showing... had a play with yeah, I've had, had a play with that. It sounds really lovely. There's another one. Past Effects have just bought one out as well. Um, just remind me if I. Yeah, right. Okay, so. This has got a level control on it, which is great. The past effects one actually has a blend control on it, which is also great. Um, yeah, I mean, all good. Uh, nothing sounds like my old mistress, but other electric mistresses don't sound like my mistress. So yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's all good. It's it's very well regarded. I don't. I mean, I I don't care for the flanging noise. Um, it would be interesting to try it just to see. Because uh, yeah. what you're what you're getting out there is what Dan talks about all the time. One of the things he loves so much about his original mistress is the high end, yeah, which so is important. so difficult to do in digital environment because by the time you've filtered out all the noise, you're really messing about with all the high end frequencies as well. And uh, yes, that's why he loves it so much. So if they've made it sound more like that, happy days. As I said, I don't care for the flanging noise. <laughs> Just for anyone who wants to know what the original looks like. Close your eyes, Michael. Should I buy some bigger shoes, Dan? Come back, come back, come back. Pick the light up. Come back, come on, pick the light up. There you go, there you go. No, dark, light. Uh, come on. There you go. There if you can, we go. Yeah, Look at that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Like that. Make a photography of you yet, Dan? There you go. Good luck. Um, Mick doesn't like it when I kick the mic stands. No, Dan doesn't have clown shoes, but he may as well have when he walks around the studio. He can't. He can't walk past the stand without kicking it. To be fair, you are ninety-nine percent of humans. 
most humans are the same. Right. Okay. I guess it's because I've put the stand there. I know it's there. Right. Therefore, I don't trip over it. There you go. Yeah. Um, if there's shade of annoyance there, I apologise. <laughs> How are we doing? Uh, not great. Um, <laughs> John Q. John Q says, evening M&D and BV. Uh, here, oh, Hope Indiana here. Question, how crucial in pedal order is parallel? I'm using electroharmonics, try and economising physical space. Thanks and best of holidays to all at TPS. Um, if you've got multiple pedals in parallel, it's as, it's as important if you're in running them a series. Um, so, for example, if you've got if you've got two pedals in parallel, right, then order is moot. But if you've got two pedals up here and then two pedals down here, then yes, of course, it's still going to have still gain staging. You're, it's, you know, the way your signal is still going to flow into the other one. So yes, it's still a, an important consideration. Absolutely. Yes, and offers a really interesting bunch of gain options. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We, totally. We, we predicted that we'd see more overdrive pedals with parallel modes in. Um, hasn't quite come to fruition yet, but uh, maybe it will. Oh, John W777. John W777 says, thanks for all the inspiration and continuing knowledge. I'm back in a house after nine years of a flat and the amps have never sounded so good. <laughs> wow. Wet dry with a Friedman runt and a Lone Star. Not moving again. Well done, buddy. Congrats. Congrats. <laughs> Huge congrats. That's awesome. Um, Sub Rosa. Sub Rosa. Guys, here's a show idea. It's 1965 and you travel back in time. Back in time. You need to replicate your current rig sounds, but only with gear available back then. Oh, yeah. Nice. That's really nice. So. I bags the Wallace. The amp guitar bit is easy enough for me. Yeah, and me. A tremolo is easy enough. Mm -hmm. And reverb, as long as it's spring reverb, is okay for me. Difficult bits are going to be delay. 65. Yeah. And uh, fancy ass reverbs. But that's it. And vibe. Yeah. But I can do that with harmonic tremolo just about. Yeah. You've got... Oh, what was the 567? Um, it's tough. Yeah. So... But basic core guitar, guitar and amp sound, you'd have to go back 10, year, 10 more years for that yeah, to be a yeah. problem for me, yeah. I think. No, I like it, though. That's yeah, good. very nice. Very good. Well very done. nice. Well done. The Great Dell. Hello. Um, that's Nathan, by the way. Hello, Nathan. Um, uh, new, gig in, new gig in January, and I can get my Marshall 2210 half stack out of my house and into my new office in an industrial estate to get the amp working with the workplace schwang. No question, just a flex. <laughs> I like that. Very good. That's very, very good. cool. Actually, it, if we had a bit more money, Dan, Marshall, uh, Marshall Anderson's have got a second-hand 100-watt Marshall 212 combo at the moment. JCM 800 212. Oh wow! Such a such a such a great amp. If we had a bit more cash, oh, I would man. plump for it. But we've got things that are a bit further up. If anyone out there wants a really cool uh, two twelve Marshall combo, they're they're really overlooked. The mm. two twelve Marshall combos, but yeah. can sound completely fantastic. Yeah, um, I had one back in the day. It was just wonderful. Yeah, Ainsley's got some really nice ones actually. They always sound magic. Anyway. <sighs> Stephen Perrins, I'm gonna yawn. I'm so sorry. Oh, you got me going. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. There you go. It's meat feast time. Um, Stephen Perrins. Uh, Perrins sauce. <laughs> Liam Perrins. <laughs> Which makes you feel the least sad? Uh, sad trombone noise, he says. <laughs> At low volumes, is it a valve preamp and digital power amp or digital mo modelling? So what would you prefer? Would you prefer a valve preamp and a digital power amp or full digi modelling? 
at low volume? That's a really good question, actually. I, and I, the answer is I don't know. Probably, so the problem with the valve, with the valve preamp and digital power amp. Ah. Depends on the speaker for me. Mm. The, the, uh, hopefully, through the comments over the weekend and what we've talked about tonight, I don't think the, the problem is the board. The problem is the speaker for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the interaction with it. But I'm going to go with digital modelling. I would I would go with a little digital modelling affair rather than all that mucky muck. Yeah, but I don't... Just think it works at low volume. Yeah. I mean, what I would actually like is two pro juniors on the end of a really nice pedal board, really quiet. Yeah. Super quiet. Yep. Nothing beats that. Yep. I, I agree 100%. The problem with having the... the, the valve preamp going into a digital power amp as opposed to the all and digital solution the digital solution has been designed to all work together whereas the pre and yeah. power amp thing you're you're sort of cabling a couple of things together and trying to see if it, it works um the my little uh yamaha thr 10 is an awesome little all-in-one digital modeling solution which is great fun at home mm. if i just want to you know I had a jam with Liv, and, oh, nice. you know, and it's just great. It's really, you know, quiet, not annoying anyone. Great fun. If I'm if I'm doing some serious practice and I can't be loud, I use the um, uh, the big trees because the immediacy that and it's still that that one watt valve thing, but there's something about it that's like. Um, I'll play stuff with that one watt rig and I'll hear things in my playing that need adjusting that I won't hear playing to the THR10. Yeah, yeah. That and would, that's the difference. I would agree with that. Uh, John Peterson. John Peterson says, Hey guys, I'm going to be redoing my pedal board over the holidays. I was going to use solderless cables from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on solderless? Happily holidays. We have lots of thoughts on solderless. Dan only uses solderless, but he uses the Evidence Audio SIS. Uh, for which you need a small mortgage. They're really expensive. They're, they're really good. I. It's not that I... I mean, I use some solder stuff as well, but 99% of the time it ends up going back to this stuff, certainly for the show where we're changing things in and out really quickly. I don't have 15 minutes to make a patch cable. You know, it's got to be done really quickly. But I, here's the thing. I've been using these patch cables for years and years and I know how to make them really well. And yeah. I know how to make them th that they last. It's not about, you know, look, loads of people use loads of different solderless patch cables. Everyone's got different experience with them. Just um, make them properly. But it's about, yeah, it's about knowing how to make the things properly. I can, okay, soldered patch cables are, of course, fantastic. There is no argument that they're not fantastic. Of course they are. However, you know, it took me 20 years to learn how to solder properly. And one of the issues now that has changed recently, there's a law called ROSH, R-O-H-S, Removal of Hazardous Substances. And what that means is things like arsenic and cadmium and lead has all been removed from the components. Now, leaded solder that we used to use back in the day had a much lower I melting st point. I still do than silver solder that you use now. Now what that means is if you're making a soldered cables now, you've got to be so on it because the heat that you need to use yeah. to get the solder to flow is so much higher. Now, it, if you know what you're doing, it works fine. You get in and out really fast, but getting to a point where that works really well, it takes a long time. The core, the, the cable becomes so hot that melting through into the insulation is so easy to do. So it's just one of those things like, no matter what you choose to do, developing a knack for it, yeah, it, it is, is absolutely essential. So, you know, I really like the evidence audio stuff. I really like the, um, the square plugs if you want to use solar stuff, it's really good, but it's really tricky. Yeah. Um, you know, look, uh, uh, 
Eric Johnson still uses George L's on his cable. Yeah, I used George L's and for then, ages. What, you know, what? you can't you can't say to Eric Johnson, "Well, mate, you should be using Solder." It's like, <laughs> no, he's, he's going to say to you, bloo, 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 exactly. Bloo. Um, yeah, it, where they go wrong for me is I make them and it's all good, mm. and then I move my pedal board around, and then something goes. Then they I'm not as good at making them as Dan is, and they're not as robust. Mm. So I. I end up having to snip a bit off the end, remake it. So one little tip I would give you if you're going to go the solderless route, A, practice before you do it. B, make them tightly longer than you need so that if you do then need to shorten them, you can shorten it a little bit. Yeah. You know, and it's only, you know, 10 mil or so. Might only be 5 mil, but 10 mil or so. Sorry, if you're in the US, um, 8,000 inches. Uh, just a very small amount. Mill means thousands of an inch, doesn't it, in, in uh, America, I think. I'm talking about millimetres. Um, you can snip a bit off, remake the cable, and not have to use a whole other bit of cable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good luck. Good luck. But in terms of sonic quality and all that, don't worry about any of that. Yeah. Just crack on. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tanelli Nordberg. Tanelli Nordberg. Hi, friends. What are your thoughts on a JTM45 as a gigging amp? It seems a bit loud sometimes. Uh, what are good OD pedals to pair with it? Thank you so much for your show. JTM45. Great. Loud, yes, but it's only 30 watts. Yeah, um, and awesome, awesome gigging amplifier. Uh, obviously through a 412, that's going to move a bit of air. Depends what you're used to using currently and how loud you can be. I mean, I'd happily use a JTM45 alongside a Hot Rod Deluxe and be quieter. Um, good pedals for a JTM 45 because it's a Marshall. Uh, we always think the sort of slightly flatter response overdrives and boosts are more preferable than stuff like tube screamers and the mid hump. Mm. Now that plenty of people use tube screamers with Marshalls and get a great, yeah, great response. But we tend to like things like blues drivers, um, blues breaker. Uh, and the JHS Morning Glory is a really great example of that. Um, full tone OCD, uh, just like a classic straight down the line overdrive that isn't stupidly mid humped and bass cut like a tube screamer. Um, yeah. Boosts, Thorpey Dane, yeah. um, Thorpey Heavy Water, Thorpey Warthog. Yeah. A really oh, awesome with an amplifier like that as well. A really good thing to try is having uh, using an underdrive. Ah, good shout! So use your underdrive, and Great the underdrive shout. is on basically all the time. Great and you shout. take the underdrive off for your solo boosts. Yeah. Um, but the the JDM forty five is such a wonderful pedal platform that with the underdrive on and you're getting gain sounds, but it's turned down. Uh, but the amp still sounds. Awesome, but then you've got all that lovely headroom when you take yeah, that off yeah. to do your solo boosts. If, if you don't quite understand that, crank the amp so it's overdriving and sounds fantastic. Get your overdrive pedal in front, but have the output set lower so that when you turn the pedal on, everything gets quieter. That's the concept of underdrive. And you'll also be benefiting from those power valves and the transformer and everything working in the amp, so you should get some nice harmonics and stuff going as well. Because really, those traditional amps, they do need... They need to be working a bit yeah depends on the gig uh obviously no one's going to allow you on a silent stage with one but if you do the kind of gigs that me and him do um no worries whatsoever yeah Fun. really lovely thing yeah actually preferable to our 50 watt plexi i would say i wish we'd got a jcm 45 instead of a 50 watt plexi right but um that's good for some other things isn't it it really is good for some <laughs> other things um airfire hello ed hey mate my dad is about halfway through his recording of his prog album. Awesome. Dan, now, Ed, you phrased this as a question. I'm going to change it for you. Dan says, would you like a copy when it's done? I'm going to say, Dan, I'm going to send you a copy when it's done. If so, how do I get it to you? Ed, you know how to get it to us. You've been here. There you go. In the post, mate. That's yeah, the way yeah. to do it. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Well done. Yeah. No, never ask. Ed, just send it. Make him have it. Make him have it. Yeah. Look forward to it, bud. <laughs> G Barge. Hello, G from hey, Northern mate. California. He says, loads of love, DM from sparkling Northern California. <sighs> it's no sparkling question. here too, just the ice. <laughs> yeah. 
No question or comment today. Just many thanks and a wee something for your Nashville bucket to your good Oh, yes. Brilliant. In the bucket it goes and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you, G. I did get massive pangs watching the Country Music Awards the other night. Of like, I need to be there. When can we go? Soon. It was actually, it was a bit depressing with all the guitar tones. But anyway. Oh, really? Mm. Watch it. Tell me what you think. Let's go over there and sort them out. Actually, one of um, Zach Brown Band were really good. Right. And there's a couple of others who were okay, but some of it was very fizzy. Yeah. Anyway. Let's have um, a word. Paul Matulovic. Hello, Paul. He says, evening, gents. Thanksgiving week here in the USA. Time's almost upon us to write our <laughs> letters to Santana Claus. <laughs> very good. Did um, you hear about the um, the uh, dyslexic occultist? Sold his soul to Santa. Awesome. Dan is officially allowed to make dyslexic jokes. I am. Yeah. My, my son who's severely dyslexic. Yeah. And he thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> um, two dyslexics at the top of a ski slope. One says, uh, have you got a cigarette? The other one says, what am I, a tobogganist? <laughs> it's not even a dyslexic joke. If you're offended by that, please don't be. Um, how did we get onto that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, oh yeah, Santana Claus. Santana uh, Claus. Very I good. wanted to gift a shout out to Collector Effectors out of North Carolina. Their stuff is ace. Excellent. Collector Effectors. Very good. Pretty good name. Pretty good name. Please check out Collector Effectors uh, with love from Paul Matulovich. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Chris Groom. Hi, Mick and Dan. No question. Just wanted to support you. Oh, mate. That's so kind. Thank you very much. Uh, he says, P.S. Maybe a new hat for Dan. Chris, that is really, really, really generous of you. Thank you, man. That's uh, wow. That's a big deal. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. We Thank will, you. We'll put that in the pay Dougie fund, I think. Yep. Yeah. Given that we, he is going to start sending us an invoice soon. <laughs> <laughs> and he deserves one for this one. He does. Show, I'm he telling does. You. He was on form. Yeah. Um, and the Great Dell again. Everyone should have a birthier piece of gear. Mine's a 1984. You weren't born in 1984. Oh dear. Marshall, JCM 82210. What's yours and what would it be if you don't already have one? That's a really great question. My first uh, suggestion would be this. See, I was born in 74, which is not great. Yeah, I'm 71. For lots of things. Now, there mm. might be a Fender amp in 74 that would work for me. There'd be plenty of Marshalls from 74 that would work for me. Yeah. Um, J&P. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there, there is a Strat out there that would work for me. Definitely. Ainsley Lister has got a really great 74 Strat and a 71, and they are both fantastic guitars. Right. Um, so that's probably what I'd go for. I wonder a, what, a Marshall, probably. I wonder what year the Space Echo is. I think it was later, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. 70s, though. When were you born, Dan? 71. Like quite a lot of choice for you, I would yeah, say, yeah, in 71. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm golden. Yeah. Um, Space Echo, Wikipedia, 74. Oh, there you go. So you're, you're, you're in. I'm golden. They yep. probably weren't very good in 74. Ah, um, Echo Rec. Yeah. Yeah. They're still doing those in the 70s. Yeah, cool. Yeah, great. Yeah, a nice like, 71 Echo Rack. Check out the um, number one albums list from 1971. It was a pretty damn good year. Um, uh, yeah, lovely, lovely question. Lovely question. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Pratt. Boys, I play a telly through a Sir Bella head and a cab. I'm thinking of getting a 65 Princeton reissue. Mm. It would be fun to use as the second amp in stereo. What are your mm. thoughts? Uh, yes. Yeah, that would work. Do it immediately. You could Amazing. do it in stereo or you could do it wet dry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Bella's really nice, actually. It would be yeah, good to really, get one. Yeah, or really, at least really good. get borrowed one for a minute. Yeah. Let's see if our friend Nigel can lend us one. Yes. Smirk bar. Smirk bar. It's like where you walk up and like, they just ignore you. We should have one of those in here, like a, just a like a metal bar. bar. <laughs> anyway, smirk bar, um, or <laughs> uh, 
<sighs> no. <laughs> All right. Another time. Okay. Another time. Um, love this show. Uh, I own shirts and a DM drive also. Well, oh, thank legend. You. Thank, thank you, you very kindly. much. Any, uh, any question? Just purchased a 59 Baseman uh, LTD, which a lot of people think means limited. It actually means lack of tweed. Uh, to stereo with the Blues Deluxe. I'm looking to upgrade the tens in the basement as they are a bit harsh. What are your suggestions? So, so one suggestion. Uh, this is the this is the new one, right? I think Jensen actually makes a speaker for this purpose. Right. I think they make a version of that P10R if that's what speakers in there. Yeah. Uh, that's less harsh. Yes. I don't know that it is that P10R, but anyway, let's have a look. So there's that. There's also, um, it's not it's not speaker warehouse. What's there's another one in America. That, Weber. Weber. I've got a couple of Webers in my AC10 twin that sound amazing, but I am going to suggest. What you might want to do is get a really bass heavy octave loop going, throw some thick blankets over the amp, turn it up and just let it, that, give the speakers a really good pounding yeah. for a few hours yeah. and That's it will a really make good a suggestion. massive, massive difference without going to, before, before you buy any new speakers, do that first yeah. because they really need. Making sure the amp is well ventilated. Yeah, of they course. really need to work. Yeah. You know, to break them. Yeah. Yeah, failing that, um, yeah, Weber, as Dan says, yeah, W-E-B-E-R really in the US. Doesn't say where you are. US dollars. Yeah, it looks like you're in the US. Um, Weber speakers are definitely worth looking at. Eminence do a great range of Fender upgrade speakers. Yeah. Um, the Eminence stuff is, is superb for that. And Jensen, please check out Jensen yeah. too. They make a really great range of speakers. And the, the descriptions on those websites should help you. Um, but we would recommend any of those uh, companies unreservedly, so... Good luck. Killer amp. It would be awesome to have one of those. Yeah, totally. I, it, it's it's slightly Goodness. confusing how we don't have a oh, basement. Oh, 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 oh. Stevie Boy 444. Hello, Stevie Boy. He says, hi, gents. Hope you're well. You've mentioned a few times that when using digital gear, there's a harsh abrasive sound at the front of the note. It drives me nuts. What causes it and what do I do to avoid it when buying? I refer to you in this one. I don't know what it is. I've always assumed it's something to do with the AD conversion. Right. And the filtering that's required to get rid of noise. So it's like there's a fixing job going on. But we know what you mean about the harsh. I hear it in plugins. I hear it in... And... Not being an audio engineer and not really understanding this, I've always assumed it's about AD and DA converters. Um, and my, my, my reasoning for this is that in the hi-fi world, when you buy a nice CD player, it is separated from its converter. So you right. buy the transport, which might cost a thousand pounds, and then you buy the digital to analog converter which wow. might also cost a thousand yeah, or five thousand right. pounds. Right. In the audio world, in studios, when you record nice things, you do it in the analog world, and then you have a a converter, mm. which is also incredibly expensive. Mm. And again, not understanding technology, what I do know about audio is usually expensive is good. Not always. But usually, it's certainly true for microphones, it's definitely true for guitars, and it's usually true for amps. It's definitely true for recording gear, unfortunately. So by process of elimination, my assumption is that to get all this stuff into a consumer-focused piece of gear that costs a few hundred quid, you have to cut some corners. Yeah. And I, my conjecture is that that's what it is. So I underline that it is conjecture, and I don't know from an engineering point of view, but I hear it as well. It's why I avoid that technology in my rig because mm. I can always hear it and it always upsets me. We've got a couple of analog preamps now we're using um, to sp specifically got them to see what it's like with the, uh, the guitar, guitar amps. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. For the recording part of it. Because mm. I can always hear a harshness in the top end. Always, always, always hear like, especially with gain sounds. Yeah. And I don't know how to get rid of it. Somebody more experienced and better at this might know, but I don't. 
And one of the ways we are definitely improving it is to use analog front end. And uh, it is making a difference. Right, here we go. So Gordon Rankin. Um, uh, Gordon, I was hoping resident, you might chime in. Yeah, uh, yeah um, our resident brains trust. Uh, Gordon is an exceptional engineer. Yeah. <laughs> Digital aliasing is the problem. The filter is required to round the note. When the conversion is done, it looks like a ramp, and the filter shapes that ramp. Yeah. There we go. Very the, interesting. Aliasing is a, is a concept that I can understand from photography and video world. So if you think about a photo or a video, for example, when you take a raw image, if you know anything about photography or video, the file is utterly colossal. Yeah. Because it, it captures all of the information. When you, when you take a JPEG or something off your iPhone, like one of those horrible new codecs they use, HVEC or whatever it's called, you're taking all that information and you're going, OK, we really need this information and we're going to discard all of that. And that happens right. in video too, where it might analyze, say, 50 frames and it will go, 60% um, of these 50 frames are exactly the same, the information. So we're going to consolidate that into one piece of information and we're going to chuck away the rest. Right. That's what aliasing in video is, basically, or is, is one of the issues of aliasing in video. So when you take a huge amount of information, and audio is a massive amount of information, and you say, I need to make it smaller, and you know this, because if you output a really crappy MP3 in compared, compared to a really nice AIFF or a, a WAV, you know that it sounds worse, right? Because what you're doing, you're chucking a load of information away. Mm. So bearing on what Gordon just said, that's what I think is happening. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the DAC or the, 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 uh, the conversion part is going... And re remember that that, that modelling and conversion is going along all the way along the chain. It's saying I'm going to model a... Um, EQ stack, I'm going to model a transformer, I'm going to model all these things. And it's just chucking away part of the information. Mm. So while it's amazing and shark processes are unbelievably good, can't wait to hear them in 10 years' time when they're 10 times better. Yeah, right. You're chucking away a load of information. That's mm. what's happening. And what you're chucking away is harmonics, interplay, all of that. I can hear it. And people tell me I'm crazy when they say I can't. But anyway... There we are. There you go. There we go. There we go. Um, just to qualify that, I've been in situations where you stick a digital amp and a valve amp together, and I've really struggled. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. So not saying that in the moment there, like in, in the example of a blind test, when you start listening to it week in, week out, and playing it week in, week out, and doing the work on it week in, week out, mm. that's when you start to really hear it. Right. Because that's when you stumble on the the things that cause you the bigger problems. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah. <sighs> uh, what do I do when buying, Stevie Boy? Um, buy analog stuff. That's, uh, that's what I do. Or better, um, get something that is definitely analog dry through. So your analog core tone always stays the same and the digital bit of it is stuffed on the top. That's chiefly important to Dan and I with delays and reverbs and things like that, not least because of the latency involved, but also we just like to preserve that that signal path. Yeah. It's, it's very controversial. Yeah. Lots of people say there's no way you can hear it and it's all crap. Um, I've got no reason to lie about it, you know? No. Um, Bartlett O'Shea. Hello, Bartlett. Hello, Bartlett. Hello from New York, and thank you for all you do. I've recently looked into a Sewell Wampus Cat, and I'm in love. Are there other amp builders recreating tweed amps who need the attention of my billfold? <laughs> billfold being a wad of cash, is it? Is that what that is? Oh, okay. Very good. I like that. Sewell, if, for those of you who don't know, Doug Sewell, he um, consults with Paul Reed Smith on the PRS amps, but also oh, wow. has amps of his own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of different ones. The Victoria amps are really good. Yes. Um, my my favourite's the Lazy J. Um, I think Jesse does the most amazing job with those. Um, they're like hot rodded, modded tweed things, you know, um, tweed deluxe with reverb using 6L6s and, uh, you know, built in attenuation and stuff. You know, yeah. His stuff is amazing. Victoria is a really good Victoria's, shout. but yeah, in Victoria's. There's really another wonderful. name I'm trying to remember who do, they do really great black panel amps, and I can't remember if they do 
uh, a tw- car tweed ones or not a uh, car I mean god he makes unbelievable he does yeah yeah he does um, oh, I wish I could remember the flipping name always posts amazing pictures on Instagram with the most unbelievably beautiful vintage guitars mm. uh, someone was going to be saying it in the in the comments section um Gordon oh. says, uh, say you're going to make a digital pedal, the codec costs less than one fiftieth of the price and the part becomes part of the problem. Any high expert, high end audio part from ESS would be like one tenth of the price. Yeah. And if you know about anything about manufacturing, you're looking at probably at least a six fold increase yeah. of that part by the time you get to retail. So yeah. you've got to use cheap stuff. Gordon's birthday today. Gordon, happy birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. Um, yeah. Gordon's a, uh, he's been really fantastic person for us to know and, and been really helpful. Gordon was instrumental in helping us get the Buffer show together and he's been a fountain of knowledge and we love having him around. So so happy birthday, mate. We hope you have an awesome day. Indeed. And, uh, you know, wish you all the very best. Uh, Lewis Electric, says Chris Quinn, I guess. Lewis about. Electric, yes. Tweed amps. Very good. I wish I could remember the name of these amps because they are really lovely amps. I'll keep an eye on the on, the, yeah, on, on yeah. those. And... Um, Um, ho, ho, good luck Bartlett hope you find something tweedy and lovely yes mate um, Per Eric Fistrom or Fistrom says Per Eric Fistrom uh, oh, hey sorry it says 633 apps is another good one. Oh, 633 yep. yeah from, yep. from the UK yep. depending yep. on where you are yep. I wish I could remember the name of these bloody apps um Anyway, Per Eric Flustrom says, Hey, thanks for such a great show. I have a Hagstrom 39. Oh, nice. Which is an 8-watt tube amp and a Vox AC15. Could I use them for Witch Dry? Uh, witch Dry. <laughs> Not Halloween anymore. Could I use the Hagstrom 39 and the AC15 for Wet Dry? And if so, which amp do I use for what? Absolutely. The amp with more headroom used for your wet amplifier and yep. the amp with less headroom used for your dry amplifier. Yep. Uh, we did a show a few weeks ago on two amps, amazing tones. Go and check that out. It's, it's my current rig. I use the J20 and the Matchless. Matchless has more headroom with the wet amp. Wet, wet effect sounds great. And I have the J20 sort of crank doing its thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah. You can do a version of that. So crank the Hagstrom a little bit. Use the AC15, depending on how loud you play. Um, That'd be pretty loud, though. Oh yeah, I mean that's plenty. That's gig volume. Yeah, totally. For most people, yep. um, if you're playing at home, get a little, little bit of love going in the Hagstrom and use the AC15 uh, for the wet. That'd be yep. really killer. Yeah. Just do check the phase. Um, should be pretty obvious. You need to make sure that one of the amps is um, isolated and phase reversible. So you can just flip the phase on the second amp. You'll hear pretty much immediately what sounds fuller and fatter and in phase. Yeah. There you go. Oh, I get all the tones I need from a telly, a duo jet, and a casino, says Gary Stewart. Yes, come on. What three guitars would you choose for maximum tonal options? Um, red, Butters, and my 65. <laughs> Dan would go with three tellies, and I, I, I knew he would say that, and I thoroughly believe him. Uh, okay. If I'm taking th- uh, three guitars to the gig, it'll be... Oh, man. It's not far off that, you know. <sighs> Red. The, oh, you go. Um, in recent times, it would always be Strat and a 335. Mm-hmm. But I've been, the last gig I did, I took the gold top Les Paul instead of the 335 and had a very nice time with it. Um, it's just a bit brighter sounding and works off the volume controls a bit better, I think because of the pickups anyway it doesn't matter so uh, taking the Leicester out of the equation because it's not mine mm. 335 Strat and probably a junior yeah this either this or the 65 the junior and the Leicester yeah because Leicester Live for some things is just killing it yeah yeah you know? and to be honest I could, I'm happy with two I'm happy with a Strat and a 335 I can do everything I need to do on, on that and to be honest probably just a Strat yeah yeah. Lovely. Um John Marshall. Hi, Hi DM. 
I have a Peterson PG120 amplifier from the early 90s. It's a great solid state amp, very loud. I find it difficult to get info on them. Any thought? Yeah, I remember them really well. Hardwood cabinet, very high end um, wow. sort of audio file guitar amp. Here you go, looks like this, Dan. Um, amazing things, actually. I remember them well from Guitarist magazine. Um, yeah, you could check the archives of the various guitar magazines. They did a 200 watt one as well, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm trying to find a really good image of one. There's some plenty of crap images. Why can't people take photos down? It's not, it's not that hard, Mac. It's not that hard, Mac. Oh, wow. There you go. Little wooden, wooden body thing there. Oh, lovely. EV speaker. Oh, nice. Yeah, I remember they were very highly regarded. Nice. Um, there must be archived. I would imagine that's the kind of thing that's probably got a little user group or a fan page or maybe... What's the guy's name? Dave? I don't know if he's still around. You know, usually there's things like that that are so unique and that were so well loved to have a little group of people who are very passionate about them. So um, do Google search and see if you can stumble across. I know guitarists reviewed pretty much all of them over the years. Um, that's that's how I remember them. But yeah, nice. Very good. Very cool. Um, Adam Loris. Hello, Adam. I love the show. I need a new amp for the collection. Good man. Got a Brunetti Single Man, which mm. is a 65 reverb. Lovely. Princeton Marshall Silver Jubilee Studio. What do I need? Lunchbox head, clean pedal platform, ideally. Uh, some sort of a Vox variant. Yeah, he I says, should say. it be a VC35? Um, you, you'll hear in a, in a video in a couple of weeks' time, the VC35 has a tremendous amount of gain in it. Mm. It does have headroom, but you've got to run the gain almost off yeah. to get clean headroom out of that i'm i don't think that's the best victory option for you um it was the lunchbox head specifically yeah uh what about the v40 v40 yeah v40 is a really good shout yeah i mean given that you've got the brunetti princeton and the silver jubilee you might find it a bit dark sounding they did a bright cap mod on it fairly early on into the production which made it a little bit brighter sounding, but it's not the brightest sounding thing in the world if you're used to that Silver Jubilee and um, especially the Princeton. Mm. Um, I wonder if Morgan does some smaller heads. Jackson. Ah, yeah, there you go. The Jackson. Jackson Audio. Not exactly lunchbox, but very small. Very small, very compact. Check they, out their oh. Britain, their Britain amp. That is a flipping killer amplifier. Yep. Yep. Yeah, do you. nice. Yeah. Or if you want to take a walk down the um, hybrid route, check out the Rev D20. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, which is worth a look. Um, our mate... Uh, uh, Howard. No. Dumble. Oh, come on, brain. Amanda. <laughs> Amanda, hug and kiss. Yeah. Um, Hugh. Guitar player plays for Carrie Fisher. Hugh. Hugh Jass. <laughs> Hello, this is Hugh Jass. Carrie Sarah, Underwood. Sean Carrie Tubbs. Underwood. Sean Tubbs. Carrie Underwood. <laughs> Sorry, I got love with you, sir. This is a prank call that's gone hor horribly wrong. Oh, better luck next time. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Carrie, Sean Tubbs. Carrie, <laughs> Carrie Humbags. <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> I thought I'd say Carrie Fisher. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Sean. Sean, Sean did, a, did a. a um, <laughs> Uh, demo this week using that Rev 20 amp. Yeah. I think it's the Rev 20 amp. Far out, man. We've got one somewhere. He is... He is unbelievable. He is such a great guitar player. Unbelievable. Yeah. He's doing this stuff, I'm like... Sean Tubbs, if you how don't do you, know. How do you do that? He's such a great guitar player. <laughs> yeah. Actually, she was on the Country Awards. I don't know if Sean was playing or not. Actually, I didn't recognise him. Okay. There, whether he's had his hair cut or something. Um, to be honest, I was uh, cleaning the fireplace because Dan was coming around and uh, I needed the fireplace to be clean. And so I was listening to the Country Music Awards. A little bit miffed that Vince Gill wasn't on it, if I'm honest. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, good. Good luck, Adam. Um, 
Good luck. Right, let's see if that is us. We've gone way over time tonight, largely my fault, um, as everything usually is. Uh, oh, Michael. We both know that's so untrue. Um, good. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we've got, yes, we've got another band show this Friday, and it is a corker. The Tour Dad says, orange or PRS lunchbox amps? Actually, yeah. The PRS, there's, they do a 20, what, one? I'll tell you what is fantastic, but it's a bit expensive. Is um, uh, the mm, tr little Tremonti one. Oh, yeah, right. That's really good. I think it's expensive. I remember playing that in Germany going, oh, my God, that sounds really good. A lot of The headroom. PRS one? Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so let's go for a last couple then. Darren O'Toole, any thoughts or knowledge on Matamp amps in Yorkshire? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeff is an extremely interesting guy with a rich history uh, and a, such an intertwiningly interesting story with Orange down the years. Um I don't know what Matt Amp is now or who owns it or... He's just done an app with um, uh, with uh, Mike Fennart. Has he? Yeah. Just very I... nicely made. Yeah. Um, the kind of, you know, really lovely made circuit turret boards. I don't know if they're through hole or whether if they're eyelet or turret boards, but anyway, really lovely traditional amp making methods, high quality stuff. Really lovely. So yes, um, that's very interesting that he's done it with with Mike with Mike Venner. Mm. How cool! PRS MT fifteen says David Michelle. Thank you, David. There you go. And um, the last one I wanted to uh, Todd Roy. Are you still on the lookout for a vintage Strat, Mick? You deserve one, Todd. No, um, I'm going through a period of financial embarrassment at the moment, so I have to rein it in a bit. Uh, so maybe in the future. Um, I want to get Mick a vintage strat, but I uh, can't. Do you have a chorus on your boards? If so, which one and how do you choose them? Says my secret machine. I, my flanger, is my chorus, but I am toying with the idea of putting my C one back on my board. But apart from that, as my um, analog man. Uh, Dual chorus. Yeah, Anal analog man by chorus one. is um, both of both Dan and I like analog chorus. He says holding up the free the tone tri avatar much multi dimensional chorus. The the audio bit of it is analog. Free the tone chorus, exceptional and um, incredible thing. If you like that kind of dimension C type sound and yeah, but it does all the other stuff too. It does is really great. Um, And then my favourite chorus that is not the Analog Man. Favourite chorus that's not the Analog Man is the Jam Wars Full. Yeah. And it's astonishing. Dan thing. and I both have that in their double pedal format called the Ripley Full, which also has a phaser in it. Analog, amazing, beautiful, amazing. wonderful if what you like is those thick analog chorus sounds, which we do. Love them. Tremendously. Tremendous. Very good. <sighs> nice out, Dan. Thanks for being with us. On this Friday show, we have the band back together and we're looking at how to use your delay pedal in your band. From short slapbacks to long cavernous delays. In the meantime, don't go changing. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Remember, if you're driving, keep both feet on the wheel. Bye, y'all.